Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the American Masterminds Podcast. Each episode, we invite extraordinary guests who are masters of their craft, they're innovators, entrepreneurs, and of course, motorcycle enthusiasts who have made their mark in the world. They share their stories, insights, and hard-earned wisdom, giving you a front row seat to the strategies and experiences that shape their successes. So sit back, grab a drink, and get ready for an exhilarating ride as we dive deep into the minds of these exceptional individuals. Along the way, we'll uncover powerful strategies, gain fresh perspectives, and explore the limitless possibilities of what it takes to be an American Mastermind. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the American Masterminds podcast. We have a very special episode for you tonight. Uh, I'm joined by my co-host, Mr. Rob Adams. What up, what up? We've got uh, Alec Langdon over here. Hello. And as always up on the soundboard, we got Scott Watson. And ladies and gentlemen, tonight we have... Corey Layton, who is the service director for Porsche Salt Lake City. We're going to have a lot of fun tonight, guys. Let's, right. have, let's just jump right in, all right? Let's do this. Kay. I like it. So Welcome, Corey, Corey. Thank you very much. Yeah. I appreciate it. Happy to be here. All right. So, Corey, this is going to tie to your German roots here, okay? <laughs> so, Corey has done something that uh, not many people get to do. He actually flew over and picked out a Porsche picked out the color, picked out all the interior, everything, and flew it back here. Corey, tell us how in the world you made that happen. So it's a, it's a long waiting list, so you have to be patient. That's really the number one thing. You've got to be patient. Uh, put your name on. There's, there's some list that, that Porsche files don't really like because you have to be on this list for so long and only a certain amount of cars are made. So it's kind of like a little bit of a lottery. You get lucky and then you finally get to build your car. So I was on a list for four years to get this. Wow. If you guys remember my pink one, yeah. the RS before yep. this. Um, so I had that, drove that for a while, it was a 2016. Um, but this was on, I was on the list for four years. I finally got to build exactly what I wanted, uh, do a paint to sample build, every single option I could possibly think of that I could actually attain. Um, and then I chose European delivery. And so European delivery is something on your build sheet. You just click it if you want to go over and have a tour of the factory and see your car, where, where it was built, and then also just pick it up where it was made and experience it. They give you a, tour, a factory tour and everything. It's a really, really neat experience. Wow. Huh. Yeah, so I picked mine up in Leipzig. So that Leipzig. was a... So now are all Porsches from Germany or do they have factories here? Uh, no, they're all in Germany. They're all in Germany. Yeah, they're all in Germany. They just make them in different factories throughout. So like the 911s, Caymans, and Boxsters, uh, they are made in Stuttgart. And then like the Panameras and Cayennes are made in Leipzig. And there's there's one more factory as well. Um, and they have they also have had to outsource and create factories in other places now, like in Bratislava and somewhere up in Russia because of the Ukraine war. Hmm. All of the wiring harnesses were made there, so they had to hurry and move their operations somewhere to avoid the war and continue to main, maintain profits and mm. build cars for people. But it was a really, really neat experience to fly over there, uh, get on the racetrack with a professional driver, have them show me what the car was capable of, and then have me drive behind them in, in not my car, but a like car. Because you can't drive your two mile car on the track. You gotta have a broken in car. Mm. So they have us do that, and then they give us a tour of the factory, which was absolutely phenomenal. Now, is it like a white glove factory? Oh, yeah. Because I picture this being like this state-of-the-art everything. It's state-of-the-art everything. They, Strangely enough, though, they learned a lot of their, their techniques from the Japanese. That makes sense. Because oh. they, were, they were expensive parts a long time ago. They weren't stocking them in correctly. And so they had Toyota come over and help them do their assembly line and solve all the problems to make them a lot more efficient, which mm. I thought was pretty interesting because, as you know, Germans don't like to admit there's anything wrong with, with their system or any type of uh, shortcomings. <laughs> Is that true, Rob? <laughs> yes, sadly. <laughs> it's a problem. Yeah. It's a problem we have. Interesting. I didn't know that, that the Japanese are known for that. Like, you can go into a, the Honda factory. You could eat off the floor at the Honda, fa uh, the Honda factory. It's kind of wild, yeah, so that, that does actually make sense. Yeah, like I you bet. Can make microchips in the same factory. Yeah. No problem. Yep. That's kind of surprising, though. I wouldn't have anticipated that car manufacturers were helping each other out like that. No, it's, definitely. It seems like a to, to a detriment to Toyota to go in and help a competitor. But I suppose they're not necessarily a direct competitor, and they probably didn't do it for free. 
And you have to think too, Porsche is actually an engineering company. They do so many other things mm -hmm. that are, they, they engineer things across the world. They're not just a car company. Car company is one section of what they do. Really? They make all, they do all sorts of things throughout Germany, architecture, uh, they make boats, they have fashion lines, they have all sorts of things they're into. So they're number one, an engineering company, and they just use that knowledge to produce an awesome car. Huh. Huh. That's really interesting because that's my, my big thing with Honda. The difference that why Honda is what Honda is, okay, reliability, they're not lookers, they're not Porsches by any stretch of the imagination, but they're first and foremost, they're an engineering company that makes cars, whereas all the American companies are car companies that have engineers. Mm -hmm. higher I did not know that about Porsche. No, for sure. So how is Porsche tied to Audi and, and Volkswagen, right? Uh, yes, Volkswagen Group actually owns Audi, Porsche. I don't know if they still own, i think pretty sure they still own Lamborghini, uh, but during COVID they sold a couple companies. They own Skoda. Um, I don't, I'm not sure exactly how many companies they own, but like v, VAG, so VW Group of Germany, they own tons of car companies. Huh, interesting. VAG is a bit of an unfortunate acronym. It is, huh? <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah. We're going to work on that one. Yeah. We all work for, for the badge, you know what I mean? <laughs> you don't question the badge. Well, it's, the it's come true, down isn't it? Just, <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> so when the, you went to the factory um, and you were, I would... I've gone to, uh, I went to a factory in Wisconsin that built um, the, the fire trucks. They're the largest fire truck company building oh, really? um, cool. factory in the world. And it was amazing. When I walked in there, though, I was taken aback by how big the production was and, um, and, the, and the complex complexity of it. Like, what was something that when you walked in, like, you were just like, wow, I would not have thought this was happening. Like, what was, what was your, your impressions when you were walking through? Um, my impression was how, honestly, it sounds, sounds simple, but how tall the ceiling is, it's like, I'd say five stories and they have cars that are on like almost conveyor belts. They're on their own wood. It's almost like this table. Basically there's a car. Imagine a Macan or a 911 or something just on this table and it's being transported around the factory on its own. And as, as it goes into the next stage, you have people that walk onto this platform and do the next step of building the car. They put in the wiring harness or they put in the, someone does the door panels hmm. or someone does something for the car on each individual little platform. And they're, you know, two stories up and they're doing stuff along along with all of these cars. Hmm. So it's kind of cool to see all the stuff going along. It's like this Willy Wonka chocolate factory, but for Porsches, it was awesome. <laughs> it was super cool. That is cool. Are they um, in that stage? Are they painted? Are they ready to go? Like They are painted. Hmm. Yeah, they go. That's the first step they go to. We didn't get to see that because that's a place they don't let uh, consumers see. They dip them in zinc and then they just, uh, they apparently they just paint them somewhere else and then have them all trucked in and they truck them in and put them on the roof. And then from the roof, they lower them and then bring them onto the assembly line. Wow. Which, wow. Is, which is pretty cool. Um, and uh, I try to catch them and just like ask, because you know how like whenever you're doing something, you make mistakes along the way, right? To, to make a perfect product, you, you're going to make mistakes. You're going to make things go wrong and you have to figure out how to fix that and adjust that. Well, they don't like to admit that anything's ever gone wrong. So I'm watching. Um, there's one specific part of the... Uh, the production that they put the back window and the windshield in okay. okay so they have these giant arms they look just like this only around 20 feet tall they grab it grab the windshield and they put the urethane around it this little thing spins and then they have one arm that does a laser around uh the the frame of the car and then this arm comes in at like mach 5 it just comes in like this almost scares you and it goes about a quarter of an inch from the car and it goes and that's it it just puts it on there. And I first question, I go, what happened when that thing fucked up? Because <laughs> that would have just ruined a whole car right there. The guy's like, never happened. Never happened. Never, never happened. I'm like, <laughs> you, you can't bullshit me. Something happened. No, man. Please yeah, that, tell me. That security footage is gone. <laughs> it goes back to the Germans not admitting anything, huh? No, man. Well, the Japanese and Toyota especially, they use the um, continuous improvement system, a Kanban yeah. system. Um, yeah. It's a Six Sigma um, practice, and they're always continually improving. There's never a time that they're not looking for a, that 30 second 15 second improvement that edge in time that edge in efficiency and i i admire the hell out of them that they were able to and i, I, I maybe it wasn't humble maybe it's wisdom but they were what they were wise enough to lean into that system because that is what is yep. uh, the still mills anything that's running with efficiency is using this very same method of thinking and so that's i think that's amazing huh 
Interesting. That's, that's it is. My it's job. super Lots cool. Lots of Japanese influence there. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think there's any question that Japanese, in terms of, of their production and, and how they go about everything that they, they do, they're the best at it. Yeah. They're, they're, I mean, there's a reason Porsche, of all people, is calling Toyota saying, hey, come in here and help us, you yeah. know? Yeah. There's zero waste. That's what they're trying to look for. They're getting rid of all the waste. There's no... There's no one taking extra steps. There's no one, like the, the bolts are right there. The windshield, everything is just perfectly organized. It's, it's an amazing system. I did this study. It took about three years for me to get certified in this um, methodology. And um, it was kind of blew my mind that we don't all think this way. They should teach this in high school. They should quit teaching about whatever the hell it is they're teaching about, but how to like continually improve your life, how to continually improve methods. And huh. yeah. are, you a, are you a lean Six Sigma black belt? I am. Congrats. Man. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. I'm a yellow belt, so I'm working my way there. <laughs> Own it, buddy. Own it. <laughs> I would imagine that the uh, the Porsche dealership, um, you know, with uh, with their their high standards for their product, they, I, I would imagine the like your your the quality of the experience that you, they provided you was really world class. Like when they when you showed up, and how did they take care of you? So here's where I'm a little bit torn on the way that Germans do things and the way that Americans do things. All right. So they hold us to a very high standard of, of customer satisfaction. So we're, we're used to, let's say, the, the Ritz-Carlton, uh, St. Regis, the five Montage, star. Five Star, where it's very, very customer oriented. Um, the, the German experience was cool, don't get me wrong, there was nothing wrong with it. But it's it's much more cold. It's not nearly as warm at all. It's not. There's no smiling really. Yeah. They their their culture is is basically if you smile, it's almost a sign of weakness mm-hmm. in a way. So it's it's a lot more like we're down to business. We're glad you're here. Let's get what we need to do done, and then get you on your way. Yeah. So that was a little. It was. It, the thing is, there was nothing wrong with that. It was just kind of strange, dealing with the uh, the the culture differences. And I, the one example I have is, uh, is I went to a McDonald's. Very easy. I just wanted a soft drink because I'm like, I don't know what else is around here. Let's just get this McDonald's. And there's no employees. There's nothing. And some guy walks out and he stands in front of the counter in front of it, though, not behind it. And there's a bunch of little conveyor belts behind. And you go and pick your stuff on the touch screen. And then you go stand over in this little, like, yellow square. It's almost like a penalty box. It tells you to stand over there. Like, okay. <laughs> wait for my drink and then on the conveyor belt the drink comes around the guy brings it to you and then he just hands it to you and walks away so i'm like all right well i drink my drink i'm just people watching the square and everything and i go look for garbage and there's nothing because it's all clean it's super clean which is really cool it's a mcdonald's right, right. normally you're like it's not like it's not clean but you're like ah, oh, this place isn't the best you're kind um, of usually trying to overlook things. Exactly. Well, this place, you're like, it's super clean. So I, I'm walking around looking for a garbage. And the guy looks at me and he rolls his eyes. He's like, oh, like you can tell I'm American or something. <laughs> tourist. Yeah, tourist. <laughs> and he goes, he does this thing. And, uh, and so he t- t- takes me over to this little, like, bread warmer. And so I open it up. And that's the, there's a bunch of trays. You just put your drink on there or your garbage, put it on the tray, and you close the door. And then I just left. And it was one of those weird things like... That was like a, a metaphor for my entire trip. Everything was not hard to navigate, but way different than what you're normally used to. So yeah. it was just, oh, it'd be fine after two months. But for one day there or two days there, it's almost impossible. The wow. train station, you have to have euro coins to go pee, yeah. right? What? Yeah, you have to walk in at the train station. They're like, oh, you want to use the bathroom? It's one euro coin. You're like, I haven't transferred any of my money. To, I don't know what a euro coin is. <laughs> I guess i got to go get euro coins somewhere at some vending machine, and then I can go pee. It was just a weird experience. Wow. Super cool, just different. Is that what your experience is over there? Uh, you know, I grew up there as a little boy, and so it was much more lenient but very serious. Um, on They had these uh, house frows, or the, they would be out sweeping the sidewalks. Like the, It was extremely clean and very efficient, and it was, uh, yeah, it's a different world. But you're right. I think if you were just to go over there for one day, you'd be like, what the heck? But I, I lived over there for a long time, and I didn't know any different. But it is a serious crowd. They are not, like when it's business time strap up because you're it's for real we're talking about getting stuff done and i i kind of am that you know what i mean like when it's business have you been around me when it's business time like let's get to it's work all making totally. a lot of sense yeah. Yep. yeah it does make sense doesn't it? Yep. But, and, I, I, and i like that i mean that's how i like to be as well it's business but also i smile i like to make it like a yeah. good time 
and they do care about their employees a lot a lot like a lot they want to make sure their employees have uh one month off a year like they shut the factory down from like june 14th to i don't know july 7th or whatever for everyone it's just completely shut down everyone goes on vacation on those specific times and strangely you're you're uh, from there nobody goes on vacations in their own country yeah i'm like the, the guy that uh was my track driver he had never even been to stuttgart lives what? in leipzig it's like four hours away yeah like, never even been there i'm like how have you not been there? Like, well, when we go on vacation, we, we want to go to France. We want to fly down to Vienna. We want to go... South Africa. They travel. Yes, they yeah, travel. A lot. Not in their own country, which I thought was strange because if you've grown up in Utah, everyone's been to St. George, right. Lake Powell, the whole state. You've just gone there because you just drive around and you just see things. So it was kind of a different culture thing there, too. Hmm. But you drive across the country. Like, if you're driving yeah. from here to St. George, you've driven... You're in you've gone to France like it is exactly it's a significant distance because these countries are tiny comparatively speaking Utah is a monster state you, to state st- visits are like Europe like going from one country to the next in Europe or even or a, or multiple a, countries. A, yeah, driving right. through countries yeah it's crazy right. we, would, we did uh, some train rides as a little boy and we like we just now we're out of Switzerland I thought we just got here you know we just got to Switzerland and we were passing right yeah. on through and it's tiny it's amazing huh. Yeah, and so it's hard to get your head around when you're from these giant states. My mom, um, she's actually straight from Germany. I'm I'm an American German. Dad's from Manti, and um, she would all the time we'd be driving, and she's like, "We're still in Texas." <laughs> oh, everybody, you yeah, 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 yeah. Texas. <laughs> you never fair. won't say that yeah. when you're driving in yeah. Texas. But I, I, am, I imagine those tiny little countries that she's from. It like even still, she's like, "Oh my god, it's." <laughs> Still it's going? still happening. We've been doing this for days, you know? Well, then you go across country lines, and they have different laws, different rules. Yeah. Like, I went down into Chechia uh, on my way to Prague, and when you cross the border, apparently you're supposed to have a highway license. So you have to pay. It was like 16 euros, nothing big, but you just you don't know about it. Uh, and then Waze let me know. They say, do you want to continue using this highway? It'll be $16. Do you want to go to the website and pay? Like, okay, I guess so. Yeah. I just... I paid my little little dues and then kept on going to Prague. Yeah. Now you're qualified to drive because you paid the tax. Yeah. Oh, my God. On there, but it wasn't in Germany. There was nothing in Germany I had to pay. Yeah. But going over the border, I had to pay. It was just kind of a, just a different thing. And nobody's there to tell you. If you had a tour guide, someone that was used to it, it'd be a little easier. But if you're just on your own, you only know English, which I don't expect them to uh, cater to me at all. But I'm still like... Um, what do I do? <laughs> where is, do you know where this place is? Show them a picture. This place. And everyone says, oh, everyone knows English. Yeah. But what I was told was so many Germans know English, but they're not, it's not perfect English. They're not really good at it. So they'd rather not talk to you or not speak uh, and make a mistake than, than just try to at least fumble through it and navigate like what I would do with right. like a Spanish guy. I don't know Spanish very well, but I know a lot of words. I'd at least try to communicate with him. There's like, no, I do. I feel like that is a common sentiment along uh, among a lot of people when, especially when you're learning a language, that's one of the biggest barriers to learning languages is that as an, if you are trying to learn a language as an adult, you don't want to feel stupid. Mm -hmm. And so it's a a pride thing. Yeah, exactly. As a kid, when you're learning a language, you don't give a shit if you screw up the language, you're going to screw it up a million times, but then you'll get it right. Yeah. But they don't think about it. But as an adult, you're like, man, I sound like a six year old. And, it, and then that hinders your ability to, to grow because you can't, if you're not using it, you won't learn it. Mm-hmm. Now the, the thing I noticed about Germany too is when you're there, if you're even attempting to speak German, even if I'm trying and I'm just doing shit at it, I'm terrible, <laughs> they will forgive me and they will then speak English to me. That, right. But I have to at least attempt. I don't walk up and expect you to speak English. You know what I mean? Uh, but right. I'm going to come at you and be like... So if you give a solid college try, they will respect and that then, you're giving it an yeah, effort. Yeah, and they'll you, go to their broken English right. easily. And it happened quite a bit, but they didn't want to start with English. It's kind of like a mutual thing. Yeah. Like you show me that you're willing to, to... Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it was interesting. Huh. Hmm. Yeah. Last time I was in Germany, though, I was 11. So, I mean, I'm that kid that was just making stuff up. <laughs> so you didn't have the little magic drawer in there to throw your trash away, is what you're saying? I, 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 I don't remember that. Yeah. But they had McDonald's. Yes, they had a they had a few American restaurants, and which I didn't want to go to. I didn't want to. I, I don't eat McDonald's here, right? But 
I was there. I'm like, hey, you know, I'd like a soda just because I'm walking around this. It's only like eight in the morning. There's a farmer's market being set up. I'm grabbing apples. I'm like, no money at all. It was awesome. Like, hey, here's 50 cents equivalent. Can I have an apple and walk around with that? And I'm like, oh, there's McDonald's, something I kind of know. Let's walk in and just grab a drink. Sure. Yeah. So that's really the only reason I went there. So when we walked around to multiple bars and restaurants uh, throughout my trip, and it was it was really cool. Um, a couple of the restaurants, they didn't really speak English at all or didn't want to, and the food wasn't like the – you look at the menu, I had my Google Translate going on for the whole menu, and I'm like, nothing here looks like I want to eat any of it. Um, so we went to this one bar that had just like hamburgers. And it was an Irish bar. Of course, it's an Irish bar. <laughs> always. Irish bar serving hamburgers. <laughs> and we go in, and, and the and the uh, the concierge guy, whatever you want to call him, the guy that greets everyone, he says something to me, a long sentence in German. I'm like, oh, let me just start out, bro. Uh, I've been to like six different places, and no one knows English. I'm sorry. Can we just have a table? I don't know if you understand me. And he and he, he like kind of like rolled his eyes a little bit, and he goes, oh, I wish everyone was as, as honest as you when they first walked in. Right this way, brother. I'm like, fuck yes. I love this place. Uh, I was so happy. So then he came over and him, he had the girls that were in the bar come over and talk to us and show us all of the, the Chechen beers, all of the German beers. They're like, hey, the Chechen beers are like the best. Even though we're German, uh, these, these beers, are the ones. these are the ones, yeah. have these. So and they had one that was called Budweiser. A, a Chechen beer called Budweiser. And I go, what? that's got me all over it. <laughs> Two of them. <laughs> so that, and that place, it was kind of strange too, because as, as we left, um, I gave him a tip. My, my bill was only, I want to say it was like 60 bucks or whatever. And I gave him a $50 tip because they were awesome. Mm-hmm. And that's even a, a pretty big tip in America. Yeah. But they, the, he walked back over and said, hey, sir, you made a, you made a mistake. Because they're expecting like, three four dollars for this it was it was wild everywhere i went we over tipped like crazy but because of the service was so good i'm like no you guys were amazing please have the, i want you to have this that bar that bar tab that we just had in america would have been like 200 bucks it was nothing here for some reason so you and your staff deserve it please take it and that happened in like four different restaurants we went to prague the girl was like we're like check uh uh prog money check money what what what's good as far as a tip and you had to do math in your head they're like well it's 600 of these and i'm like all right what's that i'm like three dollars (laughs) now me and my buddy had this great dinner and we had two giant steins of of dark prog beer it Mm. was awesome it was like 21 american dollars it was so great i gave her 20 bucks like it was like okay here's 20 bucks for that and she came back she's like no i can't accept this it's too much money i was like no, please take it. Yeah, we know what we're doing. We're like $41 for me and him to have a full dinner and, and drink beer while we're here. No, please take it. And she's like, this will be the best tip that I've gotten all month. All month. And so, wow. and so we're like, we'll be back tomorrow. Yeah, see you tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, see you tomorrow. Yeah, the table ready for and I want the exact same food, everything. It was a weird, and everything is crazy, too, because all the buildings are really old, right? Yeah. They're like, from the 1200s, we walk downstairs, and we're like, you know what? People were tortured here like, yeah. in like the 1200s. I guarantee it. This is like the dungeon. Yeah. I see bodies. Or yeah. As I go, I see. Yeah, I see dead people. Yeah, people. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> totally. Yeah. That is crazy. But, I remember thinking, this is our new build. Our oldest buildings are like newer than their, their you know what I mean? Like we got nothing. Yeah, yeah. nothing. No history here. And we, I actually took a tour. I did the tourist things. I'm like, I want to know about this city. And this was in, this was in Prague. I actually went to Czechia for way longer than Germany because they spoke English. Everyone did, so it made me feel comfortable. Mm. And I wanted to do everything there. I did all the tours, the boat rides. I went along the river. It was amazing he- seeing all the history. And the one thing that stood out was he, uh, my buddy owns a construction company. So he's with me and he's like, look at all the architecture. How much, you couldn't even bid any of this stuff out. It's just so ornate and wonderful. I, I just, I love it. Craftsmanship. What's that? Yeah, the craftsmanship. But when you think about it, uh, we asked how long it took to build this particular church or their, um, where the president lives. I don't know what, what he called it, but someplace, the parliament kind of a place. And they said, well, we started this building in the year 1402 and with the plan to have it finished in 1675, but it took toward the mid, mid-1700s. mid And we're like, it took over 300 years to build this building? Oh, my dear Lord. We're like, so, and the lifespan back then they said was 41 years. Yeah. So 
that we're you talking know, three, we're talking six generations or more or more like <laughs> of working years we're talking probably 10 generations of actual people you start that first brick and your 10th grandchild finishes that building wow you think about that that's older than our whole country it's crazy, crazy. to think about wow i read a book that talked about they had the master uh the master mason and he was putting together the idea and he knew full well he would be dead long before this building would ever be finished and it was england and um it the book talks about how he the lengths that he went to in order to communicate clearly his vision all the time because he knew he wouldn't be around for it to end and so like it just it was a really interesting book because it wasn't just like i think i'm going to build a church it was just like he he had drew all of the how the the rain gutters were going to come down and how you know just just some crazy cool stuff in detail that would we would never think about here in America because it's just like ah we're gonna start a house and have it done in twenty minutes right. you know what I mean yeah and these it was it was really a great book because it it really made you appreciate that that kind of perspective like that long three hundred years to build this cathedral you know he's like George R. R. Martin like the Song of Fire and Ice will never be finished yes Game of Thrones just the TV show's done he's like I'll finish the sixth and seventh books in whenever yeah. somebody else can finish <laughs> that. that's right that's right <laughs> amazing so i understand so you work you work here with porsche you're oh i guess i have a question before then so then how, did you, how long did it take for the car to get home um yeah. i dropped it off in leipzig and it took about two two months and eight days yeah. to ship it to, to ship to have it from the time that it got to the factory and then it went to the port and got over here through customs and finally arrived at my dealership. Any trouble with customs or anything like that? They do it all the time. No, uh, you just you can't leave anything in the car. If you, I found out that I left something, it gets taken. Mm. Not like that. It's a a bat. They weren't like stealing it. It's just that I left. They have this little gift they give you. They make it a huge deal to this little gift that Porsche makes this weird. Uh, not an ashtray, but it's this crazy glass thing. They go, only people that do European delivery get these. These are mm. super neat. I left it in my front trunk, and the box was open, so they just took the thing oh. and left the box. Oh. Oh. Not that I didn't really care about the thing, because I was like, what the hell is this thing anyway? But there was part of me that was like, well, that was a thing that was only like for me and a few people. Not not many people get to yeah. do this. I wish like, I had that. I almost feel bad in a way. Oh, like a little bit. I'm like, yeah. oh, I should have at least put it in my bag or something. But then again, I'm like... I don't want to carry that around my whole trip. That sucks too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so did you drive the car all through Europe uh -huh. when you were there? No yeah, shit. I got on the autobahn. We went to like a couple different uh, old castles to just see what those were all about, see all the history in that. It was super neat. It was cold because it was uh, March 1st, so it was snowing. Uh, I got to go on the autobahn though with, with the car. And the autobahn is basically just a highway. Right. It's a really nice highway. Uh, with no speed limits in certain areas and then really slow speed limits in other areas. But I got going 150 miles an hour, and it started snowing a little bit, so I'm like, Ugh, I better back off. But I wanted to go way faster. I wanted to just top the car out if I could. Wow. But it was just too cold. <clears throat> huh. So, okay, before you get to your question, we got to learn about this car. So this isn't just a 911 that you can get down at the, at the dealership, right? No. No. Tell us about this. What is it? And, and what makes it so special? So this model's uh, the 911 GT3. It's the it's basically the the race car version of the race cars. Basically, so it's it's the higher end racier version of a Porsche. You have a 911 Turbo that's actually faster, but the GT3 is designed for track use. And so it's like the it's a 9,000 RPM horizontally opposed six cylinder. So that means rather than a V8. You have horizontally opposed all the pistons go this boxers. way. So it's a boxer, exactly, like a My Subaru. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm, a, I'm a BMW bike guy, too. So the oh, nice. Yeah, the boxers. Right on. Those are cool. GS? Yeah. Oh, yeah. cool. Though. There's a bunch oh, yeah. of, what, what's that? B, BDR, the, uh, the yeah, back. The backcountry discovery. Backcountry discovery, which is super yeah. cool. Yeah. yeah. Most definitely. It's a great um, way to get away from the death missiles of the, of the cars that are on the highway. Totally. You get, you get on a dirt road, and all your worries are on yeah. you. And stay, <laughs> you break stay your little, life, it's your fault. Yeah, there's still stuff out there. <laughs> yeah, stay at little right. properties along the way yeah. where there's there's nothing out there, but at least they got Wi-Fi set up on certain <laughs> it's properties. Like, it's kind of cool. This? Yeah. Thanks, Elon. Appreciate that. Yeah, but uh, so it's it's just the, the race car version of a 911. It's got the big 
big spoiler that I arguably, like some people love it, some people hate it because you're like a, a little kid still, which I am <laughs> not growing up. I'm like, if it doesn't have the wing, I don't want it. I might want the thing that looks like a Hot Wheels that I grew up putting around my mom's waterbed. All of the Hot Wheels, yep. just lining them up. Like I've loved cars since I was like two, three years old, as long as I can remember. So this is like, it was a dream come true to get it. I actually started crying when I got the car. I Dang. that. Amazing. Well, I didn't, I just thought as I was coming around and pulling in, I, I, th- I thought, who in the world's beautiful car is that? And so you chose, it's like an orange, right? Yes, it's called Pastel Orange. So Pas- it's a paint to sample. It's, uh, the, the story behind that, I told them earlier, but I'll, I guess, give you a, a recap. Um, I started with Porsche in 2007, and they came out with a GT3 RS that was in GT3 RS Orange at the time, but it's called Pastel. And uh, I always said, I wish I could have that car. I started with an Infiniti, G, Infiniti G20, and it was like a $1,200 car. Like now, I'm like, I can't afford a $200,000 sure. race car, but I would love one. I'd love that car, that color, everything. And so now they're really, really expensive, those exact models. And so I just decided to get a new one, which is still an expensive thing. But like rather than go back to an older, slower car that's way more money, I want a brand new one and just put that color on my car. Very cool. So that was the, the story of that. You knew what you were going to get when you went over there. So being in the business, you kind of know, like I wouldn't know what accessories or ads to put into a car. Like what are some other things that you added to the car that perhaps someone wouldn't think about that make the car exceptional? Um, well, there's, and you have to think about resale value. You really do because it is uh, it is a special car and there's a special group of people that if you don't get a certain option or certain things on it, that it's going to uh, make it worth less money. Mm. And and they just, that's just all there is to it. So you got to make sure you option it correctly when you build it, too, for the resale value. Um, it's debatable on the brakes. So there's a brakes. They're called uh, Porsche Carbon Ceramic Brakes, PCCBs. Um, it's an $11,000 option to have these brakes. Wow. And Jesus. if you had to replace them, they're almost fifty grand. It's oh crazy. God. But for the $11,000 option, that's what everyone wants. They want those PCCBs. So... It makes that that's like a, a no brainer for eleven grand. You, you just do it if you have the chance to do it. You do it. Okay. Uh, that and uh, the LED headlights, like the special headlights that they have, um, is another option. Front axle lift is huge, which is a uh, it's it lifts at about two inches basically. So you push a little button and the front end raises, so you can get through oh. places like your driveway. Got it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I bet you had to use that getting in here. For yep, sure. I sure did. <laughs> and then, and then little things like uh, deviated stitching, which means the color of the exterior color of the car comes into the car. So you have orange stitching all throughout all of the the carbon bucket seats. The nice. dash, uh, the dash is leather and not like the the plastic type of material. I don't know what they call the actual other material, but it's not leather. Um, so things like that are. Are a big deal when just the touch and feel every everything inside. Wow! But um, that's that's really the the main things: the brakes, the headlights, um, and front axle lift. Those are the main things. And I guess it, it could say the carbon bucket seats. Mm. So they're mm. they're the sport seats. They're like six grand. You just option for those versus they call the other ones couches. The other ones couches. They're like eighteen way, really nice seats. They're super comfortable. But you're putting those seats in a race car, so it almost like doesn't fit Does it's it more for like right? yeah like if you're gonna put those seats just get the the other models of 911s that are more comfortable because sure. it's not a comfortable right. car huh gotcha i gotta tell you this what Corey is saying here so so Corey's wife amanda has worked for or worked for us for a very very long time i hear all the you know secondhand stories of of Corey's car escapades you know um Corey, you don't lose money on cars very often. When you say this, that like resale value is something that you factor into when you buy these cars. Is that correct? Uh huh. Not just Porsche. With almost every car I buy, uh, cars are a depreciating asset. They're not something that you normally make money on, and sometimes you have to be willing to lose the money. If you love cars, you just go fine. If this, if I sell it for zero dollars when I'm done, I'm buying it the because GT, you enjoyed it. This GT3, if I if it was worth zero dollars, it's totally worth it to me. Hmm. It's an amazing experience. I love the car. But yeah, I put a lot of thought into what cars I buy so that I don't lose money. And then I'll also, as a guy that's married, you can justify it to your wife much easier. If I, if I, I go, all those stories. Stories. Yes. If, I, if I go, this car was worth $230,000 should go this house is, or this is almost as much as our house. Uh, and I would say, okay. But the thing is, is the day it got here, somebody offered me $300,000 for mm-hmm. it. Yeah. 
Wow. That that's a huge factor in whether like if you let's just say uh, I don't want to pick on another brand, but let's just say a Mercedes uh, S63 that's two hundred and twenty thousand dollars, and then one and a half years later it's worth one hundred and ten thousand. Right. You know that that doesn't work for me. I don't care. Like it's not it's it's not necessarily the money, but it kind of is because. I can't invest that. I can't continue to have other cars if I'm losing $100,000 in a year and a half on a car. I can't do that. I have to keep cars that are expensive, but then I can also afford other ones that will hold their value. So I have an E46 M3 uh, Mm -hmm. that that I picked up for a decent price, but they hold their value. They're actually going up in value right right now. I have a 1949 Mercury, uh, which is an old lead sled that I've wanted for years from that movie Cobra. I don't know if you guys have ever seen it. Yeah. Long time ago, and that one of those, it's crazy. Those things are however much you want to make them. Like you put fifty grand into them or a hundred thousand dollars into them, they can be worth two fifty. I mean, they can be worth a lot of money if you do them right. Well, like you said, you started off with an infinity. Mm-hmm. That was kind of where your your journey with this. You've done this because I I know about ten, you know five or six of them, and the time I've been working at Utah Legal Group, you've constantly flipped these, and and that's how you got to flying to Germany and and doing this. Can Uh you speak to that a little bit? Yeah. Um, So I took a leap of faith on one of them. I really did because, I mean, when we really think about it, the amount of money that you need to make every year to reasonably justify a $200,000 or $250,000 car is a lot, right? I mean, for the most part, if you're talking to any financial advisor, which... I'm not, and I spend my money stupidly. If I'm being honest, I could I could probably retire a lot lot sooner if I didn't do this. If I didn't love cars so much, but the, so my my journey started with basically I I started to pay off my my low end cars, my small cars for twenty grand, whatever, and I'd sell it for twenty five thousand. Like I put a, some money into it, but I'd have a Dodge Challenger and I would make it really cool and sell it to somebody that wanted all the stuff I put into it. So I'd make a little bit there, a little bit there, and then I'd get up to like a BMW M4. Mm-hmm. Bought that, had that paid off, and then I decided, you know what, this car's worth fifty thousand bucks. I'm just gonna make the plunge to a GT3, just straight to a GT3. I found one, and the market was right at the time. Found one for one hundred and nineteen thousand bucks, and I'm like, wow, that's a that's a big jump. I don't know if I should do that, but I do know they hold their value, so let's take a chance. So I I just what I did is I sold the M4 and I pocketed the money. I just kept the money in my account, the full fifty thousand, right? So I've got that, so that my and I did a, did a loan on the GT3 for the full $120,000, like just full thing there. And the payment was more than I'm even close to comfortable with. But I said, you know what? I'll try to make the payment with what I make every month. But if I fall short or if, I, if I'm in trouble, I'll use this nest egg of the 50000 I got to put toward that car every month. But if I do make it, I'm still going to put at least 1000 of that uh, toward it so that it pays it off faster. And just so happened, what I got it for was a really good price because two years later, COVID was in full swing and cars went through the roof. Right. And so I ended up selling it for $160,000, like a, almost two years later. And then I was able to acquire an RS, which is like the higher model. So a GT3, you have an RS, which is a really high model of it. That's the, the top one. I was able to acquire that for a really good price, and and I drove that for ten thousand miles and sold it for almost twenty grand more than I bought that one for. So then it just keeps on compounding to the new one. I was on the list already. I was on the list before I even bought my first one. I'm on the list. Like, okay, maybe I'll get one of those one day. Might as well just be on there. And even if I even if I can't afford it, I'll sell my spot. I'll sell my spot for ten grand to someone that doesn't want to wait. Oh wow! You know, like yeah, as a as idea. a a plan in case I can't afford it, that's fine. I mean, if I can't, it is what it is. But I was just fortunate enough to be able to sell those cars and then put money down on this one to where it makes it kind of an affordable car. It's 230 grand, but like it's somewhat affordable for me because it's not that much money anymore. Well, and like you said, the, the, the 2016s, they're already doubled in that. So is this car one that's projected to, you're gonna, it's gonna go up in value? It's tough to say. You never know. That's like predicting a stock. I, I don't know. Who knows what? Because those those 07s that I really loved, they dipped down. They were like 140 brand new. They dipped down to like 95,000 about, let's just say, 10 years ago maybe. And then now they've just shot through the roof. So now they're like in the three hundred fifty, four hundred thousand dollars $400,000 range. And the models above them, like the RS models that are a few years newer, they're like almost a million. Oh, my God. So y- you never know. 
which which cars are really going to increase in value but i know gt cars will always hold their value always so it won't go down it's just a matter of yeah and if it goes down it may go down a little bit but it'll never be that swing of like you paid 230 it's only worth 100 it'll never happen how do miles play into that miles used to play into it a lot now that covid's occurred um people started driving their cars because you couldn't get new ones new right? cars weren't available for two years right so they started driving them more and more and more. So now every GT car has quite a few more miles. So it hasn't. So it's not so much of a stigma anymore to put twenty thousand miles on a vehicle. Oh really? Yeah. It's. I mean, it, it's it's better to have a two thousand mile car for resale value. But if you have twenty, it doesn't hurt you like before. You'd have two thousand miles on a hundred thousand dollar car and you, it'd be worth 150 because you kept it in like really pristine Men, condition right you went put twenty thousand miles on it it's worth 120 still worth a lot of money just not as much as like it would have been if you kept the mileage low there's not that much of a penalty anymore for putting miles on so i had forty nine thousand miles on my rs which was one of the highest mileage rs's in the whole country because i took it to San Francisco, up to the Redwoods, to, to uh, Oregon and back, Lake Tahoe, Crater Lake, all sorts of places. Because I want to enjoy the car. Sure. Right? The fact that 49,000 is the highest in the country is fucking mind blowing. It's crazy. <laughs> it, well, it's... <laughs> but are they factoring in track miles with that? Because track miles and street miles are two different, two completely That's different very things. Fair. They are, but there's no way of knowing. Only, yeah. we, all, only we know is to just evaluate the car when it's for sale and go, okay, how does this car look? And mine was perfect. It was a bunch of highway miles, so it looked, it was fantastic. And I had two layers of PPF and wrap on it. Nice. It was like the paint was flawless when I pulled that stuff off. Mm. So it's 50,000 miles, but it looked brand new. Huh. So, and I had to take a hit on it for the mileage. I really did. I mean, if I had low mileage, it would have been worth like 220 but I ended up having to sell I sold it for 180 which isn't a huge deal because I got to enjoy the car. Yeah. Sure, sure. Yeah. It is crazy, though, to think 50,000 miles on a $200,000 car, oh, you're up in a, you're a high mileage now. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's almost <laughs> worthless. It's not, which is nice. But they're good machines, right? They, the mileage... You could take these cars to 100,000, 200,000 miles, no problem, right? For sure. I, have, I mean, there's no, there's no evidence of a GT3 being that high in mileage. There's just none out there. But the other cars that Porsche has, definitely. They have 150, 200,000 miles. I've got one I worked on today that was 336,000 miles. Oh, it's still, It's still running perfectly. It needed a little bit of work, but it was fine. Huh. Well, 300,000, a little bit of work is still yeah. a bargain, right? Yeah, yeah. totally. Hmm. Amazing. You got questions formulating over there? Oh, I'm just doing the math. I'm just, <laughs> <laughs> he's trying to figure out what your net worth is my, right my now. German, my German was <laughs> sticking out a little bit. What are, you, what are you trying to figure out? Um, I was just thinking like about your first car and then rolling it over and then the $50,000 into the account and then paying. Um, you're making a monthly payment on that one. You had it for so long. Um, so you, um, you, of course, increased your equity in that position um, and then rolling that one forward. And that means that you were taking this much into the next car. Just kind of. I love that shit. And interest rate takes a hu- it's a huge thing though too because this this new interest rate on this new car mm. is way higher than my other ones. I just had to do it because you have to take a higher interest rate for the German delivery. Mm. It's for whatever reason they charge you one percent more APR to take German delivery. It's just a thing, and you have to pay for the car before you even take delivery. It's one of those weird things, but it was worth the hit. I I couldn't just go, oh, now I got a chance to get this car. I'm not going to do it because it's forty dollars, forty more yeah. dollars a month. Yeah, I, I can't do that. Yeah, well, and plus, you know, you and I, I'm not figuring any of the um, the finance charges and all the other crap they like to tack onto that. Oh yeah, and it adds up quick. But I can, I, I'm on a, I'm I'm a, I'm an investor, and I roll houses. I do this with homes, and so when you're talking about cars, like. My, I go into the ROI mindset, like what's how how, but I don't. I think you have to drive it to Washington. You know what I mean? It's just a, yeah. It's just parked it's a, over in West Valley. City. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's, there's nothing. There's no heart in it. It just is what it is. Totally. But, and it's an investment, though. It's something you have to sacrifice for if you want it. Like sure. it's not for everyone. Oh yeah. Like my wife, for instance, she thinks I'm absolutely crazy for doing it. She trusts me in managing our finances because I've done well with them, but she thinks I'm crazy for wanting to just spend this much money on cars and just go drive around, go enjoy, go see the country. I, I like to do that. It makes me feel good. I like driving fast. I like yeah. hitting 190 miles an hour. I just like doing that. So, and you can't do that in 
a Camry, right? Right. You just yeah. can't. You gotta buy the right car to be able to do that in. Yeah. Well, at the end of the day, um, I I just not to get to a morbid point, but when you're laying there and you're taking your last breath, you're not thinking, I wonder how much money I have in my checking account. Right. Thank thinking, God. I'm dying thinking, with 250000 I had a wonderful yes. experience taking my, the, what doing something I wanted yep. to do in something I wanted to do it with someone I wanted to do it with. That's what fucking matters. None of the other stuff matters at the end of the day. Totally. And so I respect. That's amazing. Good for you. I love that. And my, my theory is it's along those lines too. It's just that if I'm not taken away from my kid's future, if I'm, I'm still putting in for my daughter's college fund, I have my retirement set up with my Roth IRAs, my 401k, not wealthy by any means. It's just that if I have that all set up and I always contribute to that all the time and my cars don't affect that negatively, then whatever I want to spend on cars, I justify as that's totally fine. Yeah. Because if I if I die tomorrow, I know that my wife can sell my cars and my life insurance and how much we have she'll and be live, fine. she'll live she'll she'll be fine for the rest of her life yeah. right now. Yeah. Not lavishly, but she'll be able to live on whatever I leave her for the rest of her life. So yeah. that makes me feel okay spending these crazy amounts because I should be making two million dollars a year right if we're talking about how much you should make to afford a car like this because right. it should you shouldn't sacrifice as much of my income as i do for a car it's silly but it it makes me happy it brings me joy i don't want to sell my cars and move to somewhere on the east bench for two million dollars uh for a house and just go home and i, I just have a 96 celica because i can't afford anything else and yeah. i just live in my cool house to show i don't care it doesn't matter to me yeah well, you're talking to a bunch of guys on motorcycles. Yeah, I was so, say, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I have a very cool bike, yeah. and I eat a lot of chicken and rice. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Worth totally. it. Yeah. Worth it. I love that. Well, um, if you're if you are um, if you're looking to do this, so let's say that I'm thinking, wow, you know, I could build equity in a car. Like, how did you? Um, achieve the knowledge to do that successfully. I can tell you how I did it with real estate. I can tell you how I came to the point where I'm like, that's a solid investment. That's a good deal. Like, how did you build that that wealth of knowledge? Mainly just my love of cars. My studying, it's it's not, you're not even really studying like every night about cars. It's just like going through and knowing like which models are like. I, I always call it a curse, to be honest with you, because um, let's just say that, we'll take my 49 Merc, for example. Um, Cobra was the reason why I wanted this because it was such a cool car. But a 49, a 50, and a 51, they're three years that are very, very special in the Mercury world. Um, and there's a 48 that's behind it that looks nothing like it. Totally different animal. Could pick that car up for five grand and redo it, make it all nice, and have a $20,000 badass old classic. It'll never be worth very much money. I don't like it because it's expensive. I like it because of the like what I see, what I look at, and I go, okay, this car is what I want. And it just so happens to always be this, this expensive thing that I hate. Actually, I hate that it's so expensive. <laughs> I, that I, loved, I wish I loved. I wish I loved something else. Yeah. But that's just that's like it's like this curse of like I just want that thing that I want, and even if it's too much money, I still am going to figure out how to make it happen and make it work. But also, I take into consideration. Is it going to be worth something to somebody else? Am I, am I just liking this because I like it and I'm the only one? Because if I am, that sucks. If I'm paying fifty grand and no one's no one's willing to pay even a thousand dollars for it, uh, I may have chosen the wrong thing. It needs to be desirable though too. Yes, yeah, right? the forty eight. All of a sudden, you're into that the old the model that doesn't matter. The, doesn't matter. Yeah. I'm like, I want an old truck. My wife's like, Can we get an old truck? I'm like, Yes, let's get an um, F100, 1955. Let's do that. So I go and look at them, and there's just shit boxes for sale for forty thousand dollars in the middle of a field. Yeah. I'm like, I chose the wrong damn car again. <laughs> <laughs> you have to have a tractor to load it. Let's go with a '54. All oh, that one's a thousand dollars. That means nobody wants it. Yeah. So there, there's part of me that like, and I'm not, I don't, I'm not skilled enough to take some rust bucket out, out in like a, a field and redo <clears> it completely. <throat> I still have to have like, I can do a lot of mechanical work on it, but I can't do metal work yeah. on on the car. So. I have to be careful what I buy, but really that's just just experience mainly. Like like you in real estate in the, in the market, right? You just know like, all right, well, if, I, if I'm on 20th East, this shitty house is still going to be worth way, way more than a baller house on 80th West in Magna. Yeah. You just know that. Yeah. So you just have to take that consideration of like, is it worth the money though? That's where I'm at as far as like trying to find a house is because I've wanted to move for a long time, but... Everything I find, I'm like, I've grown up in Salt Lake for so long. The house isn't worth 
a million and a half dollars. It's not worth 800 grand. You're like, 800 grand is still a lot of money for a house. It's still a solid mortgage, especially right now with 8% interest. Right. Like, I don't, I don't want that old house that was like maybe 225 10 years ago, right? We're not talking about Great Depression prices. It's like 10 years ago, these houses were really, really affordable. Then all of a sudden, they just jumped up like crazy. So it makes it to where no one can move. Yeah. Unless you're really willing to dedicate your life to that real estate, to buying that real estate, and that's important to you. You make it for money, or you just want that for your kids to be in a different school or whatever. That's your sacrifice. Or you started with that piece of crap, that $1,200 car. That's the thing. Like, that's, that's how it works. It's like, I didn't start with that, that house, you know what I mean? But I started with that $1,200 car that you're talking about that you made a little bit on, and, and you start to grow it. And so it's, you can't jump in. You can't jump into the middle of the pool. No. You can't, you can't just b- walk up and buy that car, not a regular person. And most people can't walk up and buy that house. But if you're doing this, if you're doing it and doing it, well, look where you are. It's amazing. Mm-hmm. And so I always tell people, like, whatever it is, get started doing it. Yeah. yeah. To all my employees, I make them do 401ks. Yeah, get I'm, started. Every single one of them, they start. I'm like, hey, you, I'll give you six months, but we're going to start taking 6% into your 401k that goes to you. I don't care if you're 19 years old. Pay yourself. We're, we're doing that for you. Yeah. Right. And even if, even if you don't like the idea of that, you're going to thank me for it later. I promise you. Yeah. I didn't start till I was 26, which I was still relatively young to start that. Uh, but it, it makes a huge difference. Time yeah. is a huge, even if you only put 200 bucks in or a hundred dollars, every paycheck, just do that. It will accumulate over time. And it really, it's, it's a smart thing to do. It's the secret uh, as I'm growing older. It's uh, what is that book called? The atomic habits. Have you read that book? Yeah. Have fantastic. you read that book? Yeah. Yeah. Atomic Habits is great. It, talks, habits. it just talks about these tiny, tiny little things that you start to do and when you're 26. And then when you end up being 52, all of a sudden you're like, man, look at that. That worked far, out. Look how far I've traveled. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. And, and, so and, I love and barely that. even notice it, right? Like yeah. you, and, and the strange thing is, too, is you notice it's, it's obviously uh, uh, before tax money. When you're, when you're talking about Roths and, and yeah. 401ks, it's before tax money to where... You put in even 10%, right? Even 10%. It sounds like a high number when you're like, oh, that's 10% of my whole income. It's not even very much. Like you get used to like living on what you what you make oh, yeah. really easily. It's not. And then that little 10%, even though, even though it's small, 25 years down the road. Or, you're a millionaire. It, it's crazy. Yeah. It makes yeah. a huge difference. Yeah. It really does. <laughs> and I like how you said that. You need to pay yourself first. That's what you said. That's what I tell my employees. And you need to pay yourself first. And that's what they're doing. They're paying... They're paying future, future Rob, self. Yep. Um, because I mean, as a young guy, you don't not, you don't think about it. Yeah, you, you think like I'll live forever. Beer you know and chips. That, but yeah, yeah, yeah. That's where it goes, and then you wonder, huh? Where'd all that where'd all that money go? Yeah, you you spend twenty dollars on your lunch, whatever. Like you go to Pretty Bird, which is an awesome chicken place, right? But it's a seventeen dollar sandwich. No, 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 like, no cool. we can't afford that. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. About the challengers, but, but you do that and don't really think about it, and then go. You know what? I, it's not like I want you like to skip lunch or just go cheap on lunch, whatever. But like. You're seventeen dollars. It's not a big deal, but you put the seventeen dollars somewhere away, yep. and then you put another seventeen dollars next Friday when you're going to go to Pretty Word instead. And all of a sudden, you put hundred dollars a month. It's not a huge deal, but over time, it becomes a really, really huge deal. And I've learned that too over time. I'm forty-two now, so I've been doing it for what sixteen years, and it's not that long, but it's amazing how much gets accumulated in there just after sixteen years of yeah. doing it. Yeah, it's it's just amazing. Well, I love that. The, um, the other thing I wanted to ask you about is, um, you know, being in the industry that you're in, do you feel like that gives you a leg up? I mean, it seems like you're, you have an opportunity. I'm an inside investor. Like, that's how I feel when I do real estate. Like, I feel like I'm kind of cheating because I know that's a great deal right there. I'm going to jump on that deal because I'm, I'm in the business. Do you uh-huh. feel like that's giving you an advantage? A little bit, a little bit, but you have to pay attention to it too. You have to care about it yeah. because just being in the business doesn't mean that you care about prices of things doesn't mean we have people at the dealership that couldn't care less about cars you go oh, yeah whatever I, I drive an anything i get to work it's my job it's a tool it's yeah. not a passion for me my job is stressful i have to deal with i've got 25 employees currently all their hopes and dreams all the things they're i'm sick today all these things i deal with on, an, on a daily basis but every time i go out and look at that orange car and my other ones i'm like totally worth it's totally worth whatever i'm doing here Mm. and my family's taken care of yeah 
my passions are met and my family's taken care of. So this job means a lot to me. It's not because it's just a job. It's like it's my life. It's ingrained in what I do. You're a car guy. That's your identity. That's who you are. Yeah, it's, yeah. It, it is. And even though I'm not a car guy, there's sometimes I go to car meets and people are talking really in depth of, of certain cars that they're building. And I appreciate it. But I'm like... All right, I'm done with the cars for right now. I just, I kind of like just get in my little niche of like what I like, yeah. and then I just follow that. I don't necessarily love every car. Sure. I just, just love the ones that I want, and I put all my effort in and money into the ones that I really love. That's cool. Mm. I love that. That's that's the way to go. So, are you a, a member of car clubs? Are you uh, currently a member? Not really. Uh, I mean, there's there's like the PCA, which is the Porsche Club. There's all sorts of cars and coffees that are around all the city. Um, I'm not really. I go driving. I organize a few events, but not really. Everyone knows me as a very social, antisocial person, mm-hmm. if that makes any sense. I, I like to have my group of like four or five really good boys that have my like interests, that love cars, and they all have cars like mine. And we go and just bomb down Tear to uh yeah to highway 12 through boulder and escalante oh. just that crazy hell's backbone scary such ass road good road oh it just did right such a good isn't road. that i did that yeah for that isn't that road it's downright terrifying like i'm doing 120 going up to all of a sudden we start going higher and higher and higher. i'm like oh, oh 15 miles an hour <laughs> in the middle of the road yeah. we're just gonna go slow till we get over this ridge yeah. <laughs> it felt like flying on the bike that being on that ridge and looking out and just seeing, I mean, just views every direction and, and no ground underneath you, just the views out in the distance. It's beautiful, it's huh? It's such a cool experience. Really cool. Yeah. So that, those are the things. So as far as car clubs, I'll attend things. I like it. But for the most part, I'm the guy that likes to go drive and experience the car, yeah. not pull into a parking lot and talk and, about it. And talk about it. Even mm-hmm. though that's what we're doing right now, because sure. of course I talk about it, but it's not what I like to do all the time i like to just experience what i'm talking about hmm. Hmm. have you always been a, like even as a boy like a little boy you were like cars were your oh yeah get you excited about transformers it. i had almost every single one of them. <laughs> <laughs> loved them hot wheels i lined up around my mom's water bed like i said earlier uh my mom would be like hey hey Corey, look look at that diesel even though they're trucks who cares but she's like look at that that thing's a, a peter built right i'm like mom i'm four i'm like mom you're crazy that's a mac you don't know anything <laughs> <laughs> uh well tell me uh, what in your memory your first memory what is the car that like really like would grind the gears like that's like do you remember the first car that you were like i, I feel something the one i'd have to say the mercury yeah. Because that's, I was like, I want to say I was around 11, even though I liked cars. I mean, because I had a poster of a Ferrari Testarossa. I feel like a lot of people my age had that a Testarossa, a Lamborghini Countach or Diablo, and the Mercedes Goldwing, mm. the, the doors that are all yep. crazy. Sure. And I guess the DeLorean from uh, Bad Back to the Future. But that car sucks <laughs> as, a, as an actual car. Yeah. Cool idea. Terrible car. Uh, yeah, totally. <laughs> so I'd have a DeLorean because the movie's rad. That's yeah, about that's it. That's about yeah. it, yeah. So the actual car that I wanted was that Mercury. Because right. I felt like it was an old car. And I, and as young as I was, I felt like, you know what? That's an old car. I can probably afford that. Maybe that's my, my dream was just small. Like, I can afford the, I can't afford a $250,000 uh, Diablo. I don't even know how much money that is. I'm small. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so that one, I'm like, that's old. I can totally afford that. So that's, I think that's the car that I really wanted, and that's why I, I've had it for the last seven years. That's cool. It makes it more meaningful. It's more than just the, the one that was in that movie. It's the one that you kind of fell in love with. You know what I mean? That first. Totally. That first car. That's, that's awesome. It's the longest car I've ever owned. I've had it for seven years. I've never had a car for that long. Wow. And it's up in Bridger, Montana right now being chopped by an awesome guy that does multiple Mercuries. Uh the guy that helped me get the car seven years ago. And I've been waiting to get into a shop for this long. Wow. So wow. It's, What's he chopping? What's it's he doing? It's a long game. He's, uh, he's chopping. He's going five inches in the front. Uh, and I'm sorry, four inches in the front and five and a quarter in the rear. So he's just Giving making it, it a, nice, nice and sleek. Yeah. So I've already got the new frame, everything. The car's running. It's on the ground. You saw it the way yeah. it was. Oh, yeah. yeah but yeah. it's pretty much done. But then the chop is just the... The icing on the cake. Well, it's what I really, touch. really wanted. And so is that for you, or is that a is that a business <clears throat> move too? Both. Both. And to do it, you have to do it right. Unfortunately, with with these things, it's expensive to do it. But if you don't do it right, you still spend. Let's just say you spend fifteen thousand on a shitty chop, or you spend twenty five on an immaculate chop. 
it's worth the money to spend more going up front because if it looks shitty, everyone can see it. Hmm. Any yeah. any any old car guy that walks through, they can all see it. Like ah, hmm. that wasn't done very well. So you pay the money to do it right and nicely. And uh, I'm really hope I'm I'm so excited to see it. How long has it been up there? Uh, almost four months. And when did you think it's coming back? Uh, it's almost done. Oh, so really? I'll probably have it done in two weeks. Oh, wow. wow. Yeah, and then it goes right to the body shop to get painted. Are you going to change the color? Or? Nope, leaving it black. Leaving it black? No, a, a color change on a car is way too much work. Yeah. That's like pull the engine out, pull the interior, take the body off the frame. It's just too much work. And then we're talking a $25,000 paint job. I'm, yeah. not, I'm not doing that. It's, I want to drive it. That's that's the thing with me is all these all these older guys with their cool classics they look amazing they're beautiful uh, they they trailer it to the show they trailer it to where they're taking it and no I don't want to do that I'm driving it so if there's a rock chip in the window a rock chip on the on the hood I'm okay with it, it means I'm using it it's the thing that I want to drive around it I didn't buy it to show people I bought uh, it you know I, I really I really like that better than the I, I always I see those cars and I'm like that's a shame I mean that's a work of art that rolls off a trailer. And they park it on the grass, and then they roll it back on the trailer. They'll start it sometimes to, you know, just for you to Move hear the, it. Yeah. But it's not a running car, and I'm like, that is that's a shame. I think there's something valuable in it going down the road. And you see those works of art traveling down the road, and it just makes you feel like, oh yeah, that's there it is. Totally. That I can have more conversations start. Not that I'm doing it for attention, because that's not what I, that my intention is. Not that it just naturally occurs. That car will spark conversation more than that GT3 ever will. Mm. Yeah. Just so many people come up and go, hey, my dad had this, or my yeah. grandpa had one of these. Can I sit in it? Can I? I'm like, yeah, let's talk about it. And the people that actually know what it is, I really like talking to them. Some people that walk up, they go, hey, is this a Cadillac Eldorado? I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> fuck out of here, bro. <laughs> oh, man, I love that. That's I, good stuff. I think um, I, I appreciate people who appreciate. You know what I mean? I appreciate people that are good at it, I don't care what it is. If you're a motorcycle guy or a car guy, and that's your thing, and you're really into it, and you're good, and you like have invested in it, I, I always think that that's fascinating. Like, how did they come to that? How did was it? Were you born a car guy? Were you born a motorcycle guy? Because I've been around motorcycle guys that you're just like, they're talking about shovel heads and flatheads and yeah. this and that and the other and dinos, and I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> and I, I love my bike. I love my motorcycle, but I, I get lost easily. So I'm not. A, this is the club that I'm a part of because we talk about other things, but I totally have a lot of respect for someone that is really into their, their craft, whatever it is. Yeah. yeah. You're a quilter. Tell me about that. I want to know more <laughs> about quilting. Like how'd you get into that? Totally. Yeah. My, my FedEx guy, that's strange. The quilt story, my FedEx guy that comes to my work, he actually came to my house, uh, four nights ago and he dropped off a quilt for my little boy, my little baby boy. I barely had, um, and he dropped off a quilt. I'm like, hey, thanks, man. That's, I appreciate that. But, like, you just went out of your way to drop off a, a little baby blanket to me at my house? Uh, we, we're not even friends, whatever. He's all, I made this. And I'm what? like, you made it. And it was just this crazy, intricate pattern with like, little stars and all these things. It's just a quilt, right? But I'm like, you literally sat there for, like, three weeks and you made a blanket for my boy? I'm like, that's so cool. That is so cool. It's so cool. Like yeah, it's, incredible. it's it's one of those just strange things, right? That I'd never expect. And I wasn't like, oh yeah, I wish he had a quilt. I could just go buy him one. But something about that blanket, I bet you, I'm gonna have for forever. Yeah, you'll right? have it yeah. a while. Just something like, super cool. And yeah. my FedEx guy out of nowhere, he goes, "Are you home?" I'm like, "Yeah." <laughs> Why? <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. That is cool. Well, what do you see? I mean, if you were to look into the crystal ball, like what's the next car? Like where are you going? Like it seems like you've got your car right now. You've got right? the, you got the baby in the crib, but where do you want to go? That's a that's a good question. It's Thanks. a really good question. I I don't know because it's like it, for me, it's almost the it's almost the pinnacle. I can't be done, right? I mean, I'm not young, but I'm not old. I'm 42, so like I can't stop buying cars and i can't drive this car for two hundred thousand miles i'm not going to do that to it i want it i almost want it to go to a collector that will keep it low mileage after i've enjoyed it for a while and maybe he enjoys it a little bit but uh i, I got not, a deal on a house with a shop out in grantsville you let me know <laughs> 16 spots that grantsville wow. that's that's where i go like i love to go out to grantsville like where that's at with that that uh exit that takes you to dugway yeah, and it goes yeah. back up through rush valley it's one of my favorite places to drive ever in the whole world because it's just brand new pavement. You can do 
You know, it's pretty much like what people would tag on Instagram as like, we're in Mexico somewhere. Mexico. Uh, it is. It's that place, though, because it's a beautiful stretch of road that you can do. I mean, I did 207 miles an hour in a specific car. Not mine. Mine won't do that. Uh, and then go through Rush Valley. It's beautiful. Out yeah. there. It's awesome. So that that might be something I consider. It really would be. That's a fun. Uh, that's a good spot. We did that drive. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And it looks like a runway. It's that straight. Like you are, uh-huh. you can look for miles and you can, it's just a, like a laser beam straight road. Following Roger. Uh, that'd be kind Following of Roger. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Had, his, had the throttle all the way over. All the way. Yeah. <laughs> We, yeah. we have one of my buddies came out with us on these high speed runs because we'd like to like pretty much not close it off but like have radios and go okay there's a two mile stretch of beautiful straight road no curves nothing it's just a straight nice road you sit here you sit here and go okay there's nobody not cops we're not worried about cops it's just worried about people we don't want anyone to be passing us while we're sure. turning these speeds we want to keep it safe and reasonable still even though like I guess if we die doing it that's that's our yeah, problem it's on you yeah it's on you. Uh, but uh, one of my buddies, he has a, I don't even know what his bike was, but he was doing, uh, he, he hit 189, Dude. but at 186, he came through with a wheelie. He was doing a wheelie at 186, and he passed by the radar gun. What? It was, in, we're like, dude, you can't do that. Because, <laughs> oh my because God. I don't want to go down the road half a mile and pick up your arms yeah. and your, your pieces. Don't. Do pieces. that. That's what it would be. It would oh, just dude, pieces. he would yeah. be for miles. he would be gone, yeah. and he, he's like, "Oh, you need to go to the Isle of Man TT with me." I'm like, "I would love to, but you're not racing in it. I don't want to watch you go to pieces." Okay, <laughs> that, that's my main point in this story. A Willie at 189. Yeah, oh 186. God, you yeah, imagine that. I can't even imagine 189 on a bike. Can yeah, you? I've had I've had a big sexy up to about 120. Oh, really? Yeah, and that's terrifying. That is that's that's moving. Ours shut down at 112, right? Yeah. You have, yeah. Um, they have. The fastest on the FA50 was 140. <sighs> that was stupid. Are they, um, what is that called? Do they have a governor? Yeah, yeah. I think oh. it's governed at 140. I don't know. I didn't want to test it. That's scary. I think my, that's mine. Mine's governed at that speed. Like 125 yeah. is the yeah. governed speed of mine. But and I'm okay with that, you know? Yeah, I'm, I was, I'm done with that speed. I'm not, <laughs> I don't need to go anywhere at that speed. It's more than enough. Yeah. I, I'm not a motorcycle guy. Not because I don't like them, but because it scares me, to be honest with yeah. you. Like, going on one, like, I'm going 75 miles an hour. I'm on 7th East, and I hear somebody, their tires screech, whatever. I'm like, I'm just, I'm going to die on this thing because somebody's going to hit me or I'm going to hit loose gravel. I just think of all these bad things. I don't know why. It gives me anxiety. I'm like, I can't do it. Cars don't do that to me nearly as much, but a motorcycle definitely does. So him doing 186, I was like, I was like his mom. I'm like, don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> Son, Bad. Listen. Son, listen to me. <laughs> don't take your gun to town. You're like six years younger than me. I can tell you what the fuck to do. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Well, you're 10 years younger than me, so let's talk about real estate afterwards. I got some ideas for you. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I need to get invested in something smarter than cars. <laughs> well, I have, uh, a, I have a question for you. So you, uh, you're the... the the service director for Porsche. And you were telling us before we came on here that your your technicians and whatnot, you're you're trying to motivate them to keep going and do faster because they can make um, more money but because of the book rate. Could you explain that a little bit? And then I have a follow-up question for you a little bit too. Sure. So in in a general service department, every I mean, we all have service managers are pretty much like, we don't have different jobs across different brands, but it's almost the same. It's very similar. We're all in charge of keeping employees, keeping them motivated, keeping them happy, um, but then also keeping everything productive. And you don't want to focus fully on numbers. Some people do, and that's just what, what their life is. I don't like to do that. I like to focus on my people, my guys below, because if they're motivated and they're happy and they want to do better in their lives for their careers, they do better naturally within the work right. environment. If I'm constantly going, you need to be at 100, 110 hours right now or else uh, we, we're, you're on the fence. You might be fired. I don't like that. That doesn't motivate you. and It wouldn't motivate me. I was in the military and I don't like being yelled at to do better. I like being told... Here's what you can be, be. Here's how you need to be better at this, and then you. It's on you. If you're not better, you have to decide if you want to work here anymore. But if you can do better, even incrementally, um, I'm going to reward you for doing that. What branch? So, I'm sorry to interrupt. What branch? 
Uh, the army. All right. All right. Keep going with your story. <laughs> <laughs> so, so really, how flat rate works is a a technician will say they'll they'll bid a job. Um, let's just say they have to fix, um, I don't know, an alternator. A cayenne alternator would be a six hour job, which that's what we would pay by the book because the first time they'd ever do it, it'd probably take them nine hours because it's a really difficult job to do. But if they've done 25, 30 alternators, they can probably do it in three and a half, four hours. Mm -hmm. It still bills out at six hours because they've gotten just more efficient at their job. So they make six hours and it only took them three and a half to four hours, just random numbers. Um, and so if they keep doing jobs like that throughout the pay period, they can theoretically be there for, you know, 80, 80 hours every two weeks, and they can make 150, 160, 180 hours at, at their rate. And their rate's going to be, it's going to vary based on skill. So it's going to be $25 an hour, $40 an hour, whatever that is on their skill. So they get their $40 an hour times 180. That's how they made, how, how much they made for two weeks when they're only there for 80 hours. If they're not very good at their job or if they're just not motivated or not efficient, they only make 70 hours. That means they only get paid 70 hours at their rate, but they were there for 80. That means they like they lost, lost some money. time just being there. So them being not good at their jobs or not motivated, that doesn't mean maybe, maybe somebody that's got 70 hours is just not motivated to be any better. Maybe they don't care about money or they're, or they're unhappy with something, so it's making them not, uh, not be productive. So the chance to make money is, is there. But we see even in trained, seasoned people, you go through lulls. You go through things mm -hmm. like you just, you're not motivated, you just don't care, or, or you paid your house off, right? You paid everything off, and you know what? I don't need to cover a 2,000 a month nut. I only, need, I only need 40 hours this pay period. Well, from, from, for him, that totally works. But from my perspective, for me managing people, I can't have that. I, 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 got, I have to at least have a reasonably productive person or else I have to find somebody else that can do it and make money for the store. That's how we keep the lights on. That's how we keep everything going. Sure. And so that's, that's pretty much in a nutshell what I do. I just try to keep everyone as motivated as, as I can um, and just keep the, the train moving forward. Let's, oh, I'm right. sorry. So if I'm a mechanic and I've got this job is a six hour job, the alternator on the, on that car and I'm experienced, I'm motivated, and I run into problems in the job. Every Not every job, I can't imagine every job is the same. That car had a strip bolt or a, I can't think of anything off the top of my head, but you get right. what I'm saying. Uh -huh. Yeah, There's a, a broken vent line or something happens. Something happens because not everything, every day is perfect. Um, does he then, um, he loses, so let's say that job then took seven hours, that's, that's on him. It is, it is to a point. So there's, um, we, I do a case by case basis for, for some people. If I know he's a really good tech and it wasn't like, it wasn't his fault, something happened. Sometimes I'll talk to the customer and say, Hey, this, this happened. It's going to be an hour more. I really do that because I don't like to get in someone's wallet twice. I like to tell them, Hey, you know what? Here's how much it is from the very beginning. They know what they're getting into. And then that's, we, we solve it from there. Hmm. Uh, so a lot of times I'll just, if they lost their ass on it, if it took them seven hours, eight hours, nine hours, and I know they're good techs, they're always trying, I will make up the difference. I'll pay them under the, so I'll be, under the table is a weird term, but like I'll pay them their hourly rate, their, their $40, I'll pay them $3. So it costs me 120 bucks to pay them extra out of the gross profit of the entire job. So I will do that if, if it warrants it. No, but, sure. I, but I but I won't let them I won't let them do that as a as a habit because I don't want that's not a crutch I'm not like hey I'm not here giving out charity yeah yeah it's just this you just were happened. seriously trying and I I'll take care of you you're yeah. not going to lose your ass on this because the job sucked I'm not going to let that happen because it happens sometimes uh -huh. so if I wanted to go to uh, I wanted to show up and I want to be a tech in in your shop what kind of a accreditation do I need to have in order to make that happen? Um, usually we like to have someone that's at least been to like UTI, which is a training facility down in like Arizona. Um, the last two people I've hired went to a Porsche training. It's called PTAP. It's a uh, Porsche training apprentice program that's in California, Philadelphia, and Atlanta, I believe. I mean, there, there might be some other ones, but I'm pretty sure those are the top three. Um, and I pay a certain fee to hire them. And they come to the with, school, to, to the school, okay. to the school, and they come to me certified. 
So meaning if I just hire someone off the street, because I can do that. Like if you want to, you want a job, I go, okay, it, do these classes while you're working here, while we're giving you oil changes, doing this for one year, we'll send you to training for a week, do this, and you can become a bronze level technician. It usually takes two years ish to do that. But these guys, I pay the fee up front, so they come to me certified. There's still a gamble. Are they good technicians? Because just because you're good at school or you know you're smart and you know things, doesn't mean you're good at working on cars. It or mean, showing up or all the things. Exactly. Right? All the, it doesn't mean you're a good technician. You just you put in the training, and so I'm giving you a shot. It's costing me ten grand to even get you, so you better make it worth it. Because I know you're, like, like one guy he traveled across country from Florida to come uh, to come work here. And I want to make it work for him. I'm never going to say like, okay, well, you came here. You're not working out after a month. So, yeah. See, kick rocks, bro. Yeah, yeah. I would never do that. I want to make sure that like he has an opportunity to, to make his mark. If he doesn't after a year, we just have to talk. Like, hey, you're not cutting it. We need to figure something out, something to make you more productive. Mm, that's cool. Mm. Then, So you take it as a leadership uh, challenge more than a, um, a personnel yeah. challenge. Like, what can we do to create that runway for you totally how long is the school in phoenix uh i want to say it's around six months there's def there's different levels of how far you want to go into it but it's a, most people do it for six months and the apprenticeship the other one the um another three months to six months so, so a you, year you figure figure a year to be it's and you figure, figure a year of college is pretty nice considering if we all you went to college yep. Uh, four years is kind of a dream. Use it's like eh, it's five, six years to actually yeah. finish. Yeah. Uh, and so if I come from, uh, let's say that I've done the apprenticeship and I've uh, and I've also so I've a year I've done the year schooling um, route. What would be an expectation for an entry level service technician in a shop like yours? So it's uh, for for our market. I'd probably say what I do is. I like to bring people on for a little lower than I want to pay them because I want to see how they do and then I offer them an incentive to get there within 90 days. Mm. So I would say entry level, probably around $22 to $25 an hour Okay. to start out. And then but, after 90 days of success? After 90 days of success, $28 to $30. Hmm. Um, and, then, and then and you have to think too, $20 to $30, let's just say $30, $30 an hour, you're talking what, maybe, maybe $60,000 a year. You have to think the thirty dollars an hour. If they're good, that thirty can be way, way more than like sixty thousand. It could, it could be a hundred, it could be a hundred and fifty thousand a year. Right. I mean, because they're really can't, cranking through the jobs. They're cranking through the 30, jobs. Right. Thirty dollars an hour so for one hundred sixty right. hours. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Okay. Thanks so for that. So, so it can be very profitable if you're motivated and you're good. Yeah, and you're hustling. Or it can be. And the the, the number one question I have when I interview people when they come into me, I just ask them. This is the very first thing I say. I'm like, Are you here for your job or a career? And if they're if they're just here to collect a paycheck and have a job, then I mean, there's there's jobs everywhere. They can get that job wherever they want for twenty dollars an hour and just go live their lives. They want to do a career. I'm not a micromanager in any way, shape, or form. If I have to come over and and remind you and tell you to do your job uh, every day, uh, you're not working for me. Do you find the people that are the best technicians are more of the analytical or more of the uh, like? What's the best mindset to be a good technician? Like, is that someone, because I mean, that's attention to detail. You want that, but you uh -huh. also want someone that can relate to customers. You seem like you're very um, eye oriented. You're very uh, communicative. You're very good at speaking. And uh, I, from the disc profile? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I am. I'm, yeah. I, I, I'm partially D is what I have to be. Yeah. In my personal life, I'm full I, yeah. but uh, in, in business, I have to be more, still I, but more toward the D. Yeah. Um, you guys familiar with the disc? I'm not familiar with that. That kind of caught me off guard. What you should that? learn it. It's, yeah. it's, the, it's one of the best personality typing uh, tools that are out there. D-I-S-C. If you know how to speak to a D, you are a more... I use it. I use my, my uh, skills for good, for, not for evil. It's <laughs> because I'm a professional communicator, and my job is to be able to speak your language. And if I can't right. speak to you in a way that's going to build rapport and trust, then I am failing at my job. Right. Mm -hmm. And so it's just important that when I'm speaking to someone, I can look at them and be like, this is a high kind of eye. Match their energy he's, in a way. I bet he's an 80, 70 to 80 eye, which is pretty high eye. And then he's got a strong D component for his management skills. If you can start thinking that way and you're meeting these technicians, like I, I'm always curious to know, like the best real estate agent, I know what their type is. Um, the best, this, I know what their type is. And I, and I've been, because I'm conscious of this type of thinking, profiling people, it's, I'm curious to know. What, what you're typing for sure and you you and you have to consciously think about that 
And a lot of times I want to do it naturally and say, no, I don't need those things. I can figure it out on my own. But it's very helpful when you think about it. Like a D is a dominant person. They're really, uh, really decisive. They're, they're very alpha in a way. Like sure. they're just very like, I just need to know the information. Don't and give me the it. details. Don't give me the details. Just I don't go. want to hear your story. Yeah, I don't don't tell me how you feel about it. Is it fixed? Yeah. All right, cool. I'm, I'm, give me my keys. I'm going to fuck off. <laughs> Eyes. For the most part, I am a high eye, but I'm not. I don't relate to a lot of eyes because they just tell stories for a long time. I want it to be to the point. That's where my D comes in. I'm like, I want it to be to the point, though, not just rambling. So you're probably like right on the board. Your D and I is probably yeah, like I'm really close. Yeah, but I'm right there. And then you have S, steady, or C, conscientious. And usually the S's are more reserved, but very good employees. A lot of times they're very good employees. Uh, not good communicators. Not good communicators. Great detail. They're going to get in there and just get the job done, and it will be done perfectly. They, you can't give them a problem to solve, though. You have to give them, here's what's going to happen. Here's the number of bolts that it's going to take and get to work and give them the book and man, write down. go through it. Yeah, not me. I'm not that guy. <laughs> and then go ahead with the C, sorry. And then C, conscientious. So we're talking C's. Most of the time, I hate to group anyone into like specifically this group, but C's are going to be like your your CFOs, your controllers, your accountant people that are really sticklers on the, the details. They're the people that really want to know. So, so you repaired my car, but what are these 74 other things you did? You're like, well, we had to have all the bolts, all the gaskets, all the things. Even if they don't know what the hell you're telling them, they want to know. Yeah. And if they'll you're, read the whole contract, they'll front to back. They'll read the whole contract. Oh, okay. Yeah. And all if right. you're high I or D, it's hard to get along with certain people. Like when they really want to know all the details, you're like, it's fixed. Can you just just sign just the paper? Go away. And, yeah. yeah. Oh right. my God, we're still reading the contract. We're still reading it. Yeah, like, <laughs> like, do you read your iTunes acknowledgement? Do you do that? Because if you do, I. Oh, I would slap you in the back of the head. <laughs> <laughs> but if you really want to, that, and they're very low. Um, they're, they're like about 25% of the population. The C's are very low out there. But if you want to build rapport with them, you have to take that time. I have to show up and I'm going I'm to go through every detail with you of the contract. And I'm going to go over every number. And here's the net. And here's that. And here's that. And here's that. And here's why. They want to know all that information. And if I can't communicate that clearly, again, I'm failing at my job. Yeah. Yeah. And so, and it's your sense. it's your fault. I mean, if you internalize it that way, you can you can blame everyone else if you want because people do that, mm -hmm. or you can internalize it and try to be better and uh, adjust to everyone's. I mean, everyone's leadership skill is going to be different, but no matter what quadrant you're in, disc or whatever, the eight leadership skills from yeah. those books, um, you still have the best leaders adapt to every personality as best as possible. It never works out perfectly, and there's some people you clash with no matter what. Right. If you deal with them on a daily basis, it's really frustrating if you have someone that's like completely opposite of you. It really is. But to back to your question of what technicians that I hire, um, I don't obviously hire them based on their personality because I, I, sure. I just have to deal with what I get. Um, I would say, honestly, I would say the, the D and C would be the best uh, those two, because the conscientious people, they're a lot slower. They do the work really well. Yeah, so ready, they, aim, they, shoot. They, they usually meticulous. don't make a ton of money. They're yeah. not the producers. The D's and and even the S's too, because they're they're just they're steady. They they just have a workflow. Um, I would honestly say just someone that has an attitude of just give me the next thing I have to do, whether it's whether it's shitty or wonderful. If it's a great paying job or if it's a terrible one and you know it when you see it. Everyone knows, oh, I don't want to do I don't want to do billing. I don't want to do talk to this guy that's a jerk that never pays his bill in the accounting department or the legal department. Right. But if you just do the shitty job and get through it, you know the next one or two are gonna be a good one and you're gonna make your money. The people that just don't focus on the job, they focus on their whole day, their whole week. Those are the successful people. Hmm. The people that are just one, one job at a time and they flip out over one job and they get happy over the next one, they're not going to last very long. It's too much of an emotional roller coaster. Yeah. And I see it all the time. I'm like, just calm down. <laughs> Take this next one and just don't worry about it. Yeah. Look at this guy. He, he went through the crappy work and now he made 100 hours this week and you made 60 because you stood around for an hour bitching about the one thing you had to yeah. do. Yeah, right. campaigning. <clears throat> yeah, to no one. They're, yeah. just, they're yelling at themselves. They're just frustrated themselves. Like, stop doing that. Yeah, you're not interesting. Hurting, you're not helping anyone and you're only hurting yourself. Yep. I, and just um, a note for the listeners, if you have an opportunity to um, study the DISC, um, I have to tell you it's the greatest leadership skill that I've ever learned. 
of all the things that I've learned, and there's a lot, but the ability to communicate to people more effectively, because ultimately you still have to get the job done, regardless of their style. Right. You still have to get the job done. Yep. I just need to communicate that to you on the in the best way to get it yeah. done. And so it's just really important. I, I can't I can't say that enough. Yeah, yeah, that makes I, a lot I of sense. I agree. When, when, you, when you first get into it, you you don't think that in a way, right? Like everything, everything's new. The change is odd. Like I don't think of people in those terms i do it naturally it's all right but it's very cool to study and try to pick out what a certain person's personality type is so that you know how to deal with them and they do and for the most part sometimes people they don't even reveal themselves or what what they really are for a while and then they do something that you're like got it i know what that guy is 100 (laughs) percent. gotcha buddy yeah dialed yeah i'm a 99 i i'm the highest i i've ever met Really? really yeah I've never met another one that's at a 99. I'm a high, I'm a, I'm a 60 D. So I'm also, I've got that driver mentality, but man, I love to tell a story, but not to the point where it's just like, <laughs> what is he talking about? You know what I mean? I, maybe sometimes depending on how much um, beers I've, how many beers I've <laughs> <laughs> Well, but, there's a difference in storytellers, right? Like for me, I feel like if you go, Hey, Costco's on fire. You're like, what? What the fuck happened? Yeah. And they go, well, I turned left on third West. And what I did is I stopped at my dry cleaners and you're like, why is it on get fire? To the, no. Get to the fire. Yeah. I, love, I love the stories, yeah. but just tell me the, the actual point of get the story. Don't do the stupid details. Yeah. That's awesome. With a D, the thing that's interesting that's something you would appreciate is like, here's the problem. Here's your three choices. Give me your, your best one. And you know, Ds know immediately, oh, that's easy. This one's what I want to do. There's no hesitation. And so I really appreciate a good D. But, and I'm, that sounds I'm terrible. Wait, like, oh, like, <laughs> D, do you? As soon as I said that, I knew I was catching hell for that. <laughs> me, me too. Your, though. your yeah. eye came out there we're, a little bit. We're 100%. <laughs> yeah. We're 100 percent on, on the same Fuck wavelength there. Yeah. Because I like Gets I like point. decision makers. Yeah. I like when it's just make a decision. I tell my employees that my guys that are my my advisors, the people that have to make decisions all day long. I'm like I'm not going to micromanage you, and I'm giving you authority to do this and yeah. to do this. If it's up to this much money, just do it. I don't yeah. care. Don't ask me. Make a decision. If it's wrong, we'll discuss it. I'm not going to yell at you. I don't do that. That's yeah. not my style. I don't we, yell at people. We won't just, do it again. Just don't do that again. Yeah. That was a weird decision. I don't know why you did that. <laughs> But at least you did it. I, and I, I affirm them, too. I just say, hey, you know what? At least you did it. Mm-hmm. Thank you for at least trying and going, okay, now we know this is why it was not the right decision. Because it, financially, this just sucked for everyone. Didn't this add wasn't up. good. Yeah. So Interesting. Interesting stuff. So check it out if you I have an opportunity. I check this out. Yeah, yeah it's good I stuff. I absolutely am. There's a, um, you can take a free test at the Tony Robbins website. Take the test to, to test yourself. So the first key in uh, personality typing is knowing who you are. Yeah, and yeah. what where my strengths are, and then also knowing where my weaknesses. Because as a high I, I have a weakness. I have a tendency to go on. I can go on, and then there's opportunities for me to that goes too far. And so right. I have to be. I have to be. If I'm conscious of that, then I can work on that. Because I've, I've met um, w- eyes in the wild, and man, they just won't shut up. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> I get it. You love motorcycles. <laughs> That's awesome. You know. Totally. But. Because you have stuff to do. You're like, it's, it's still important. Like, i, I got to get my stuff done. Yeah. And I, it's, it's really funny. My last training that I was at, we got to see, like, we had to put stuff on a, a whiteboard and go come up with our ideas. And we looked at our board. It was, it was a group of I's, D's, S's, and C's. And you saw everyone's board was, like, D, S, and C were all these, like, bullet points, everything. Our board was a shit show. It was like pictures. <laughs> just, <laughs> oh, that idea? Cool. Men working. Men working. We just wrote it and then wrote something else. Like It was just this serial killer notebook. <laughs> We're like, and the whole group's like, those are eyes. Like, yeah, we totally are. And I, and I look at my desk and I, I'm like, I do that. My notes are like just, I go, it's a memory thing. I just go, oh, I just need that. I need that note there. Yeah, I need yeah. that note there. I don't care if it's in line. I just go, I need that note. Yep. Yeah. But it's there. And I look, all of a sudden I'll turn. I'm like, oh yeah, Mr. Johnson. I got to call him. <laughs> <laughs> You're like upside down. Oh, yeah. oh and, right. no wonder I missed that shipment. Oh, it drives people nuts to like come in. They're like, what, what is all this scribbling? I'm like, I know exactly what all that stuff is. You just leave my stuff. Don't, 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 don't move touch that. It. Don't don't touch it. Your orientation is very important. <laughs> well, I thought, I thought that I could always communicate well with everybody, but when I learned more about what the C's were, I've never been good at C's or S's. I struggle with those guys because they get, they get hung up in the details where I'm just like, and buy on. the house already, for God's yeah. sakes. This, I'm a big this C checks guy. all the boxes. You yeah. are? Yeah. 
It's, I don't. I haven't actually done that. I just can tell you, I'm a big C guy. Yeah, you yeah. are. I can yeah. absolutely agree with you, and that's why you're good at um, editing and and, right. and and the scripting and all of the detail that you put into it. Because I don't care. <laughs> I, I wished I did. I honestly, I wish that I was better at that, but I am not. And yeah. once I realize that, then I'm going to find me a good a good C. Yep. And the thing that I like about it is there's not a there's not a good or bad. There's there's all of it's good, yeah. But you've got to partner just with those people, it. Yeah. yeah. Harnessing well, it, yeah. And it's just like I'm going to build a team, and this is what I need. And in my team, I need to find someone that right. is a detail-oriented person because I am not. And I've got my director of operations, man. She drives me nuts, <laughs> but she thinks about stuff I don't think about. Thank God, you know what I mean? I'm, totally. I'm glad she's and you, doing it. And you can't put someone that that you like say like we work together, right? You can't put me in that role because I'm like I just. Like you, I'm like I don't I don't want to do that. You'd that, be unhappy. That yeah that that section of the business is not what drives me. I'm here to to make the money, make it work, but I'm not doing the the the, the weird things that I just don't want to do. I'm not do, sitting down and making a detailed spreadsheet uh, for all of the things and putting everything in color ca- categories and all yeah. that. I'm not doing that. Even though I look at it and go. That's super cool. You did that. That guy it's, right there. It's easy for me to see. <laughs> yeah. Let's have the colorblind guy do that. <laughs> Don't worry about the colors, but the spreadsheet is there. Oh, yeah. It's kind of pivot table. But I don't even know what that means. And it's super cool, right? You, <laughs> you see it and you're like, that's really we neat. Like I'm it. glad you did that. Yeah. Uh, I'm glad I have the info. That's all I need. So, right. See you later. Thanks for spending 24 hours, and I took seven seconds to go. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, done. That means we're going to do option A. Thank you very much. That's, the thing I appreciate so about your um, your position as the manager of this group of people is as a big picture guy, um, your business is coming to you, and they're saying, here's the bottom lines, and you're like, cool. I can work on those things. I can work. You can take all of those things and put them together and make that happen because you're a big picture guy. You're making those things happen. You're not... You're not in the trenches with the, the, and I'm sure you do. I'm sure you have to know what that because we all do. But um, I'm too much in there to be honest with you. My, really, my owner and and my GM are both like they're like, hey, we don't have any service directors or managers that are like out helping people fill up their tires and help out giving people advice out in the parking lot and getting down underneath the car and helping someone do something. None of our guys do that. You do. It takes away from some of the stuff we want you to do in meetings and being prepared for uh, fiscal reports and to answer all of our questions here, but you keep it running really well to where those numbers stay up where they're supposed to be that we think it's cool. It's a different way of doing it. And I, and I appreciate that they let me do it. Yeah. Nobody yells at me for, it. I just get to decide like, and I know you, you know, when you're, when you're slacking in things, when you, you're like, Hey, I've been spending way too much time out here doing this. I'm neglecting all the things that I have to do here. I got to get back in here for an hour and do this or else I get anxiety. Like mm-hmm. I got to make sure this, this is right. And my world's right. And then I can go help people and do what I love to do. Yeah. yeah. I love that. Have you ever read the book rocket fuel? I haven't. Um, the book Rocket Fuel is based on uh, personality typing and um, aligning um, strategically. And it talks about the greatest businesses in the world, like, you know, the... Apple. Apple. Exactly. Yeah. That. Where you yeah. had this, um, an implementer, and then yeah. you had a big dreamer, a communicator, and yeah. the implementer. And if one wouldn't be successful without the other, and so we need one another. And I, I really love that book. The part that I like best about it is it, it really made me feel, because I always... Um, like kind of look, you always look down on what you're good at and you always look to like trying to improve into the area that you're, that you want. That's how we're, that's how we're made. That's how we're in school. Like get better at spelling. I'm great at math, but my, <laughs> my spelling is shit. You know what I mean? But what do I worry about? My spelling, spelling, spelling. And, um, what it really made me appreciate is like, I'm, I'm a master level at my one thing. I need to find other people who are master levels at their one thing that I'm not good at. And I need to stay out of their way. The more that I do that, the better my life becomes. Like, uh-huh. the, and, and I think that comes, that's a little bit of wisdom because I'm giving up some ego. I don't think people can do it as well as me, to be honest with you. Can people do it as well as you? No, they cannot because I really care. But they actually can. It's, even though it's not my way, right. they can do it better. You know what I mean? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so I think there's a lot of wisdom in in that enough about the disc gosh that was a tangent there <laughs> yeah yeah but it's it's more than just business though it's it's just it's life in general too it oh, really yeah. helps you deal with like you don't want to analyze your buddies while you're drinking beer and hanging out but like it's still cool to like say okay if we're going on a road trip we're going to be good friends i need to know 
or how you react to things and how you are on a road trip with me because I don't want to like because I also am a facilitator like I want to like I want everyone to be happy like when we're doing stuff like hey what makes you happy if we're talking about stories that, that you don't care about that run on forever and it's pissing you off you're not having a good time I want yeah. everyone to have a good right. time so sure. I want to know if I'm telling you a story I'm going to be like hey here's what happened cool we're, now we communicate let's just drink beer telling you a story all right, so this is what happened. Yeah. All these things, yeah. I don't even want to tell you this story because it's, it's boring me yeah. as I tell you. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you just do it. It's true. I'm a, I'm a better husband because I know my wife's this type. I know her type. And so I know what really grinds her gears. I'm gonna, I know that's not a battle I want to choose because that's how she doesn't, communi- she doesn't communicate that way. That's not her, her thing. And my daughters, I've got four daughters, and they're all distinctly a type. It's crazy that they're all come from the same genetic pool, but they're all their own type. Yeah. And Four I, daughters. Any boys? No. You're the only oh, yeah. outnumbered that's, male. That's where the chrome Wait, comes from. Wait, you've got one of these. Yeah. You've got a disc of your daughters? I've got all four discs. you got all four? Yeah. Huh. Interesting. Yeah, it is interesting. And it's bananas to think that they're so incredibly different from the same genetic pool. But I don't, this doesn't motivate her. This, I could ground her for that. And she's like, meh, Okay. I'll see you when I'm done being grounded. You know, it doesn't work that way with her. I have to pick the thing that works for her, and ha- knowing her type has just given me this. Huh? It is, hmm. It's wild, too. I think about that even growing up. Like, being grounded for me was the worst thing. Like, you're going to lock me in my room. This sucks so bad. I, I never want to be grounded ever again. I hate it. Yeah. What can I do? Please don't ever ground me again. My little brother, they're like, you're grounded. He's like, cool, let's play Mario for like seven hours. <laughs> I'm good. Oh. I'm good. Yeah. And, and I'm like, what are you doing? You know, aren't you mad that you're grounded? Not at all. Yeah. All right. So for people like like, like you and I, you could see the, your friends out riding their bicycles, and that would drive me nuts. Like, I'm stuck in my room, and these yeah. guys are out playing and having a good time. What? <laughs> it was terrible, but my sister was the same. Great, I'll read. I'll read for the whole time. Well, you're gonna, uh, what? Uh, like, books? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've become more that way, but she did not care. It was amazing. Anyway. Huh. Get to know it. Get to know typing. I think I like the disc because it's the easiest. There's... Um, there's a lot though the Braxton um there's a, there's a there's Hicks Braxton Hicks I think something like that something like know. that whatever there's, yeah I think it there's eight that. personality types in that one and yep. that gets pretty complicated and then you've got the wings and there's all kinds of different um personality typing I pick one that you like really relates and go on that one Braxton Hicks is, is like when you're having a baby yeah, yeah yeah that's not it it's a Briggs and Stratton <laughs> Briggs and Stratton no that's a that's a motor it's a lawnmower, it's a lawnmower. <laughs> yeah See, I'm really into cars and engines. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I need to answer that. I'm gonna think of it. You should be googling that, Scott. That's your job. Yeah, what the fuck, Jesus! You are fucking googling guy over here. You're Google dumbasses and see if all four of us yeah. are there. Yeah, see my picture. See if, a, <laughs> if you if you Google Dumb dumbasses, ass. this live stream pops oh, up. Right oh, there it is. There we are. All right. <laughs> Uh, anyway, good stuff. And um, let me ask you this: as you are um, leading this generation, these um, these, and I would imagine the texts are coming in, or the this younger Myers Bridge, My- Myers Briggs, Myers Briggs. Briggs. Yeah, that's that it. sounds familiar. Yeah, that's better. <laughs> Let's go with Myers that one. Briggs. And you're trying to motivate these uh, this younger generation, this uh, the generation of now um, is what they've been referred to: instant gratification. Like, how are you? Um, Hello. Yeah, there, there he is. <laughs> how are you? Um, how are you managing that crowd? Because being forty-two, you um, don't relate. That's not your generation. So no, I'm I'm right on the cusp. For me, it's a Gen X millennial. I'm like the exact year where they're both. So I feel like I have some of that and some of that. So yeah. I have partial millennial in me because I'm like, yeah, I totally relate to that, and I totally relate to being on time. Being not on time irritates the living shit out of me. Yeah. I hate it. Yes. So anyone that's not on time, that's one of the, the, the thing. my pet peeves. I'm like, you be on time or we're going to have words. Yeah. I do not like <laughs> being tardy. You Shout can do other Joel things. Moreno. Yeah. Luckily, my, <laughs> my younger guys, they're all, they're all on time. They, they're there to work. But I think part of it is because of, of the hiring process, just in general, right? If they give me answers when I'm hiring that, that I feel like they're going to be a problem, I don't really, I'm not, I'm not there to take on projects and become a, a professor, a psychologist for anyone. I'm there to say, hey, do you want to do this? Because if you do, mistakes are going to happen. I make them. We're going to make mistakes, but we can do them together and we can work on this. But if you're just not motivated and you need to take uh, 
two mental health days a, a, a week, um, I, I can't have you work here. You, I mean, you're a good guy. That's totally fine. But you need to go do something else. This is a professional place. We're in a business. We need production, and that's all there is to it. And then you need production because you want that cool car, right? You're here because you love these cars out there. You love the car that you like. You have a Mini, right? And you want a smaller supercharger pulley, and it's $400. How long is it going to take you to make that after taxes and make it affordable for mm. you on top of rent? What do you want out of this job? If you want to just sleep in and, and not be here, I mean, you're just you're just not part of our gang. There's a Kia dealership down the road. Yeah, and, and, they, <laughs> and even them, they wouldn't accept that right. too. Like they just like, hey, if you want to make it in this world, a little bit of tough love, I guess. Mm. Like as even with my daughter, my my wife, bless her heart, she likes to she doesn't spoil her necessarily, but she likes to just kind of give in and just always talk about things. And I'm okay with like talking to her, but also I'm like, you need to do this right now. And if you don't like that, I don't give a shit. You're going to do this now. That's how it is. That's how it is. And I do that once a year. I don't ever do that. But it's like you're not going to run out in the middle of the street. This is just not an example. She never did this. Sure, but sure. still, like, you're not going to run out somewhere. If I say something in that tone, I'm serious. This is not – there's no negotiation no here. I just need this done. And then we can go back to jovial lightheartedness. But if you, you need to do this, I'm doing it for your safety. Yeah. Like, right. you can't touch the stove. Don't touch the stove. Well, fucking touch it. Yeah. Burn your hand off. I'll, I guess I'll have an ER visit tonight with you because you're not listening. Oh, man. I saw the funniest video. talked about um, <clears throat> Gen X's and the, there was a little boy running up to put a wire into the, into the plug. Uh-huh. And the mom's like, no, 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 don't, don't do that. And the dad's like, no, no, wait. <laughs> oh, see what happens. And then there's like a whoosh. And there, it's always on the parents. It's not on the kid. There's like this light, and he's like, "Bet you won't do that again." Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Totally. <laughs> uh, I'm like, that's how I was raised. Yep. For, for sure. And yeah. I, th- I think partially your the way you were raised too. As much as you don't say like nature versus nurture, no matter what the the subject. How you were raised makes a difference in how you you see other people and want to mentor them too, yeah. whether wrong or right, good or bad. Like my dad was hard on me. Like it was like, hey, you do this, and like, hey, that was the dumbest thing I ever heard of. Are you serious? It's common sense. Use your fucking brain. Yeah. I'm like, geez, oh. that's okay, making ice cream here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You know, so I don't like that approach, not to be like just totally brash, but there's also part of me that I, I deal with with people. We can't get out of line. I can't. I can't with like my owner. I can't tell John Elway to shove it. You know, yeah. I can't just do that to like owners. So like I like to at least set a little bit of a precedence for them. Like, hey, if you're doing your job and you're doing it well, you'll never hear from me. It'll be smiles. We're just talking all the time. And even if you make mistakes, it's still not a big deal. Yeah. You're going to make them, we'll figure it out. That's, yeah. I'm not even worried about that. Just tell me. If you lie to me, if you like, you break something and try to just pass it off, like, oh, I don't know what happened. Wasn't me. Uh, we're going to have a big problem there, too. Like, do not lie to me. Just be honest. We'll, we'll figure it out. Yeah. Uh, even if it's a bad thing you have to tell me, you're quitting, you broke something, uh, just whatever it is, we'll at least discuss it and talk about it, and I'll be open about it. Yeah. And you might not like the answer, but we're still going to talk. Don't be afraid to come talk to me because I'm always there. I love that. That's, a, that's amazing leadership right there. Well, let me ask you this. And I, you, have a, you have any more questions? Go ahead. I'm, I'm kind of running with the ball. Yeah. Um, where do you see your industry as, this, as services changed? And I feel like in the past couple of years, services become kind of a, um, a, an umbrella. You know, there's, um, everybody expects great service and everybody complains that it's crappy because of the way that the world is shifting to. Right. And, I, and that affects every service industry. It affects my industry a lot. And where do you see in the future your department, your, like, how can you stay on top of that? Do you feel like there's something that you can do? Are that you are doing that keeps your department a world class? For for sure, that's a and that's it's a hard it's a challenge every day, especially because we are not. Uh, we had this discussion, discussion today with my GM actually, me and him, because we talked about uh, going to Capitol Grill. You guys been there? No. Wonderful steak restaurant downtown. Wonderful, so amazing. Customer service is great, and you just you just love being there. They're so friendly and accommodating and everything, but. Your clientele, you're going in to have an amazing meal. You're going in to have a a wonderful steak, to enjoy your meal. It's awesome. Um, So you're there for a positive experience. And even if someone doesn't do a great job, you still got a great steak and it was a great experience. It was there something that you wanted. Mm. 
people are coming into a service department for any reason whatsoever. Most people are, I mean, they're cordial and can be happy, but you're coming in for something that you don't even want. Right. So we're already digging ourselves out of a hole to try and make someone happy, to bring them from here to here while spending a pretty good amount of their money. So it's a difficult it's a difficult proposition. And so I think the, the approach that, that I have is I try to make it not, not so much about necessarily the money, but getting to know the clientele, the people that come in. I know that like, I know that your, your sister, I know your mom and I'm like, Hey, how is she doing? How's the, how's the legal office going? Mm -hmm. How's, how's this Uh, motorcycles going pretty well? How, how is that? How's real estate? What's the latest property you acquired? Um, let's talk about that and I'll go, okay. now what can I help you with on your car? You know, I try to like divert a little bit of attention from the negativity that they're coming in for to try to make it a better experience. And I, we always smile. I just tell, you know, smiling goes a long way and recognizing that someone's there. If someone has to stand there for five minutes, five minutes doesn't sound like a long time, but it's an eternity if you're just waiting yes. to be helped on. And it's you walk through it's, the front door expecting service and then you have to wait for five minutes. Yeah. Even though yeah. you're the fourth person in line way out in the parking <laughs> lot, they're, you, you can clearly see your bits. they're helping other people. Yep. I Don't like know. to go out. One of my guys go out and just go, hey, I'm sorry. We'll be right with you. We're just helping these people who got here before you. I promise we, we'll, we'll be there in just a minute. Seriously. And then it kind of it kind of diffuses the situation coming in. And then when they come in, we just uh, act accordingly in the same way. We try to, like, know who they are, knowing their names. Knowing someone's name is very important. Like, just you, you just review the schedule before the, the day they come in. You know who it is. You're like, oh, Tover, uh, or Mr. Sheeler, it's uh, it's good to see you again. What what can I help you with today? Mm-hmm. It's a big thing, even though it's it's doesn't seem like it's that big of a thing. But smiling and, and greeting someone by name is important, and remembering even one personal detail shows people that you care. That it's not just a you're not just a business transaction to them. You actually care about why they're there and who they are as people, not just the business that you're in. Mm-hmm. So that I guess that's sense. that's the only way I can think of to combat the the growing service needs and the bad Yelp reviews, the bad Google reviews, whatever. And I a lot of times I'll read Google reviews and if they're if they have merit, I call them. I'm like, I want to know what happened and try to fix it. Mm. Some people I know what happened. I know that I did everything I could and they're just like I read all of their reviews and there's forty negative reviews and nothing positive. I'm like I don't know what I can do for that gentleman. So I, I kinda let those ones go off to the side. But I we just do what we can do. And it's, oh, a di- yeah. and it's a difficult challenge. It's an uphill battle, but what's what we have to do? I got to find something to, to make the service department shine above other service departments. And sometimes we do fantastic. Other times we fall on our face. We just Sometimes we just drop the ball. We got too busy. We didn't call that one person, and he's pissed about his car's been there for three days, and we haven't even touched him and honestly haven't even given that car a thought because we're just busy with these other things. And so that happens. Yeah. And that we just try to avoid that as best we can, but it just it's gonna it's gonna happen as as we go along in business. It just is. Sure, sure. Well, I appreciate your um, spending time with us, Corey, and I'm grateful for the um, the uh, the work and the time that you put into your craft of leadership and um, the service and the things that you're doing in your world. But really, what um, I'm most grateful for is learning about your your passion about the automobile and the Porsche. That was really very good for me. I love learning about that kind of stuff and so grateful that you could be on the show if you've enjoyed the show please share it with your friends um leave us a review um click a star and show us some love because we're working hard here to bring you some value we'd also like to get to your feedback if there's something that you'd like to learn about if there's something that's interesting to you um please tune in um to us and um and let us know what we can do to to interview we know a lot of great people and we'd like to bring them on the show Again, thank you very much, uh, Corey Layton, for being a part of our evening tonight, and uh, thanks for tuning in. Thank you, guys. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you, guys.